Hey, what's up? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Monday, June 27th. How are you guys? This episode is brought to you by my fantastic sponsor, Earthquaker Devices. Perfect for this podcast since it's uh, all about rock and roll today. If you play guitar, keyboards, bass, sing, uh, bongos, xylophone, mouth harp, harmonica, bongos, uh, what else? Xylophone, uh, pedal steel, uh, anything. <laughs> Get yourself a fucking Earthquaker device pedal. Candles lit. Earthquaker Devices, making fine handmade boutique pedals in Akron, Ohio. Awesome people work in the factory. They're probably listening to this podcast right now as they're sniffing solder, putting together those little fucking art pieces called stomp boxes. Yeah, they are art pieces. They got cool paintings and names on them. You know, get a foot pedal. Visit them, earthquakerdevices.com, or check out their Instagram or their Twitter Facebook, they got an amp out now, they got curly cords, they got shirts, hats, and they got vibe and soul. These guys are fucking cool. Running around all weekend with my head cut off. Yesterday, I went out to Born Free, which uh, I mentioned on, uh, I think, Thursday's episode. Yeah, I did. Chris Warren was here from Westco, and we talked a little bit about it. It's the best biker um, get-together gathering on the planet. Nothing but fucking amazing bikes and uh, plenty of boiling hot sun. If you need that, boy, head to Born Free. I got home yesterday. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll put the podcast up after I do a couple shows last night. No fucking way. Just whenever you blaze in the sun, man, it's just like, oh, I'm going to bed. I remember just drinking back in the day out in the sun on a Sunday, day drinking at the Russian River in Guerneville, doing some tubing, some bridge jumping. Jumping off bridges, so fucking crazy, man. You don't even know how deep it is. Jump off these big-ass girder bridges up there in in, uh, in uh, Russian River area. And you would just come home at like 5, 5 p.m. and just eat like Top Ramen or Mac and Cheese and pass out. Just done, man. The sun and booze do not mix. And as you get older, the sun and just nothing <laughs> the sun and nothing doesn't mix. You're just done. So, yeah, I didn't get the podcast up, but it was well worth it because Born Free was fantastic. Went out there, hung out with all kinds of great friends, and um, I love it, man. It was number eight, and I know Born Free is just getting bigger and bigger. Willie G was there. Rin Tanaka was there. That's all, like, these are heavyweights in the, uh, in the industry. Uh, let's see, Roland Sands had a great booth out there. Incredible FXR Division was there. Uh, my boy, Big Al, Big Al Cycles. And I want to give him a shout out because fucking this guy, uh, he, he and I, um, we used to go see comedy together on Tuesdays at the Laugh Factory. And we would just uh, hang out on Tuesdays and, and see comedians at the, uh, you know, when they weren't big yet. 
people like Louis C.K. And uh, I mean, they were they were known, but they weren't like these superstars now. And uh, you know, he worked at a, a shop wrenching on bikes, and I worked at Harley Davidson and Van Nuys, and that was our life. That was probably what we thought it was going to be for the rest of our lives. And that's just uh, seven, eight years ago. And now Al has one of the most incredible motorcycle custom part making shops on the planet. And any of those bikes, uh, the styles, you know, as uh, those Sons of Anarchy looking bikes, that's what people call them. But what I call them is really the Frisco look. Uh, growing up in San Francisco, that was the look of the the bike that everyone rode, the uh, the the FXR with the risers and up high stance, you know, 13, 14 inch shocks in the back, um, and you know, you rode those bikes hard around the city, jumping curbs, going up hills, bottoming out in huge crazy potholes. Those bikes were built for a reason, and Everybody rides him now, and Al has taken it to the next level where he is uh, makes parts that are bulletproof. You know, you see the unknown associates, all those wheelie videos. Those guys are incredible riders. I don't know how they fucking do that. I've been riding almost thirty five years now, and uh, I I don't I don't wheelie wheelie like that or burnouts and donuts and all that. It's fucking amazing, and Al makes the parts. That don't break. So shout out to that guy. He's got a huge business, and now I'm doing comedy, and we just laughed yesterday. Like, look at us, man. We're totally different, living a different life. So shout out Big Al Cycles. Go to the website if you ride. Do not miss out on his stuff, man. Amazing. Also, I want to give uh, a big, big, uh, big love out to my boy Danny Dangerous. Uh, you know him, he was on an episode here, he played bass in the Zeros, and he's a sound man at the comedy store for 20 fucking years, and he's just a great human. Someone hit him yesterday on his bike. He fucking went down, he's got a broken shoulder and some, uh, something broke in his back, but uh, he's going to be all right. But Wow, I just hear about it every day, people getting hit, and I know it's crazy, I got hit. Fucking look out for people out there, man. Put your phone down, you know. Stop smoking the weed while you're cruising and look out for people. You're in a fucking vehicle. Thousands and thousands of pounds driving down the freeway doing 70, 80 miles an hour. There's people out there. Watch out for them, man. Come on. Fucking just take a second. Look over your shoulder. Check your mirrors. Anyway, love you, Danny. Uh, I'm off to Denver tomorrow, and I cannot fucking wait. I have not been on the road for uh, a couple months, and uh, I'm dying to do it. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Denver tomorrow, which will be uh, the 28th through July 2nd. Five nights I'm headlining. Please. Get off your asses and come out. If you live in Denver, Boulder, anywhere in that area, or you have friends there, tell them. Let's celebrate this week. Let's have some fucking laughs. Candles lit. Let's do it. And also, I'm staying an extra day to see Dead and Company. So if anybody has a ticket, email me, deandelray at yahoo.com. I'll put you on the list to come see me at the uh, Comedy Works, Denver Comedy Works. I love you guys. Uh, I'll give you guys uh, some tickets. If you got a ticket for me, something. I got to see that show. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Toronto. I'm coming out to Toronto July 22nd, 23rd. And, uh, oh, I can't miss this. July 19th, the El Rey Theater. Del Rey at the El Rey. Del Rey and Friends. Me, Mark Marin. Uh, Anthony Jeselnik, Joey Diaz. You do not get a crazier show than that. Tickets are $10 right now. LRayTheater.com or LRay.com, I believe it is. That is July 19th, Los Angeles. El Ray Theater, Mark Marin, Anthony Jeselnik, Joey Diaz, and myself. A night of fucking fierce comedy. 
That's going to be great. And then New York City, I'm coming out your way. The Stand, I'll be at The Stand for like a week doing shitloads of shows there and other shows all over New York. Just follow my Twitter or my Instagram. You'll see the photos. And that's the announcements there. Sorry, hot, long-winded, but wanted to get a lot of shit out because I'm uh, no no, uh, Thursday episode this week because I'll be roading it. Today's episode is, uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very cool episode. I've had tons of musicians on. I've had tons of uh, rock stars on. But something I haven't had on is uh, the behind-the-scenes people. And uh, I think last week that TV show Roadies premiered, which, by the way, Ron White's on. I haven't got a chance to see it yet, but I do love Ron White. Roadies. Of course, that's what they were called in the 60s and 70s, made famous, I guess, by uh, the song uh, Road Crew, uh, Motorhead, and also uh, talked about by Frank Zappa. Roadies, not, not really a term used these days. Somewhere along the way, it changed to tech. I get it. Get a little more respect. And they do deserve uh, respect. Roadie you think of maybe as somebody like on Almost Famous, just cruising around, oh, yeah, dude, I don't have a line. But without the roadies, the techs, the people behind the scenes, these fucking shows don't happen. And as as, uh, more intricate and uh, insane the concerts got over the years and and humongous coliseums and arenas and and all that stuff... uh, Teching became a hardcore, real job. Like, I mean, it is, there's no glory on it, and it's tons of fucking work. And it, uh, you got to know your shit, man. You're working for a big rock star. I've seen dudes get fired. Just, you know, was dicking off, not thinking, and something went wrong, and boom, they're off that tour. Because when something goes wrong, somebody could get hurt or the concert sucks or the audience has a bad experience, whatever. So I thought it'd be cool. Let's have a, a, a few guys on. And I have have two different types of guys on this episode today. It's actually two episodes combined into one for you guys. Because I, I loved both these and I thought they should be together. It's a great theme. My first guest was the first uh, roadie in 1975 for uh, Quiet Riot and Randy Rhodes, really, which is absolutely insane. And uh, boy, does this guy have stories. Harold Friedman, 1975, he's walking down Magnolia Boulevard in the valley here, and he meets Randy Rhodes, who's loading a guitar out of his Opal, his little Opal car, and invites uh, Harold in to see a rehearsal, and he ends up working for Quiet Riot for about four years, and his stories are amazing. Imagine working with uh, Randy Rhodes back in the 70s before he's the humongous Randy Rhodes uh, known most to, to m- most people uh, as Ozzy's guitar player, but you know everybody that's a Rhodes fan is obsessed with Rhodes and knows everything about him. So it was great to have this guy on because he had some really cool inside stories. My next guest, uh, which is part two of this episode, is a man named Night Bob. And let me tell you who Night Bob has worked for. He has been a sound man and a tour manager since 1972. He grew up in New York City. He's worked with some of the most amazing legendary bands ever, including Oog, uh, Oog, uh, Oog, uh, Iggy and the Stooges, New York Dolls, uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Ace Freely, and of course, Aerosmith, which is fucking, and I'm talking Aerosmith from 76 to about 78, which you don't get, or 75, I, I believe. You don't get any bigger than that. Night Bob is a a sound man, and now he is a tour manager for Steely Dan out on tour. And wow, both these guys, different levels. Uh, Of course, uh, Harold, who ended up leaving the biz 
And and Night Bob, who joined on in 72 and is still in the biz. It takes a certain person to be a tech. And, you know, a lot of people couldn't do it. But it's a lot like being in a rock band or an artist. You, you, you know, you, you, most of them don't have families. You're out on tour after tour after tour, living on buses or hotel rooms. You're always gone. You're maybe home a month or two a year. And uh, your whole life is uh, that. Being on planes and buses and trains and, and all that. Going to different countries, eating different foods. It's easier now, but imagine back in the day, just eating fucking whatever you could get, you know, just here's your pizzas. So these guys are incredible, and this episode is dedicated to all the techs and roadies and rock and roll people out there. Uh, you, you know, the lighting people, the pyrotechnics, the bass techs, the drum techs, the monitor mans, the sound mans. The fucking security, the tour managers, the bus drivers, everyone in the fucking business. I salute you, and it's perfect for 4th of July weekend because there's nothing more rock and roll than the 4th of July. Everybody, have a great 4th. Stay safe. Don't blow your hands off. And uh, light the Roman candles. Enjoy the episodes. All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. Introduce yourself. Great guest today. And I am Harold Friedman. Harold Friedman. And you were the first roadie for Quiet Riot. The first roadie for the original Randy Rhodes version of Quiet Riot. Now, did you... Uh, that, that's, first of all, that's amazing. You know, like, how old were you, 15? I was 15 when... Uh, uh, I was walking up the street with a buddy of mine one day and walking down Magnolia Boulevard just a few blocks from here. Yep. And uh, here's this tall, skinny guy getting out of a little yellow Opal GT carrying a guitar case. And I don't know how he even got in the Opal with the guitar case, let alone him. And, and you know, I, I said, you know, hey, what, what kind of axe you got? Because, yeah. you know, here I'm 15 and I'm aspiring guitar player. And, and uh, he said rock and roll. And I said, no, you obviously misheard it. No, axe, axe, not act. Uh huh. And uh, he so it's Dan Armstrong, and he started telling me. He says, "Well, you know, hey, my band rehearses here, and you know, do you guys want to come in and watch us?" And I said, absolutely, man. What fifteen-year-old kid's not going to want to come in and watch some rock band rehearse? Now, what was it? A rehearsal studio on Magnolia? Uh, well, it's basically the the manager had a little triplex there. Yeah. And uh, the garage that was in the back was converted into a rehearsal space. Had, you know, egg cartons up on the wall and yeah. foam on the walls and all that stuff. Total 70s, 80s style. Absolutely. And it was small and it was loud. And, and uh, uh, I kind of ended up hanging out after a while and I kept coming back. And, I, well, you know, I got these guitars and Randy had at the time this little black SG that just would not stay in tune. Was it a, a like an SG like standard, like an Angus one or a uh, P90 one? What was it? It was uh, it was with two P90s on it. It was black. Yeah, SG special. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know it was a nice guitar, but it just every other song he was constantly tuning it back and. You know, I was 15 years old. Uh, you know, I said, hey, you know, if you need the use, I got the Stratocaster here you can use. It was mine that my, my, my dad had bought me like a year or two before. And, and uh, uh, Randy said, well, you know, I, we could end up using that for my spare. And uh, which we did for a bunch of gigs. And uh, now before we get too fast, you go inside to the um, rehearsal. And, and who's in the band? It's Kevin and Randy at Ke the time. Kevin DeBro, uh, Randy Rhodes, of course. Kelly Garney was the original bass player. Uh -huh. uh, Drew Forsyth on drums. And, and when you first go in, uh, what year are we talking? 1975. 75. So that's uh, really like a, a strange era of 70s because it's, uh, you know... It, it, it's not quite super huge yet uh, as far as like rock. I mean, Zeppelin and everything's Ze big. Zeppelin. Boston, was, Eagles. Uh, you, you had, I mean, on your heavy, and, and there wasn't even such a thing as heavy metal, man. There, the, yeah. the, 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 the term hadn't even been invented. Not at all. So, I mean, you know, on, on the heavier side of the rock bands, you're looking at Zeppelin. You're yep. looking at Black Sabbath. Totally. You're looking at Grand Funk. 
And is that the stuff you're listening to? And, and yeah, that was a lot of stuff I was listening. To. Actually, I was I was listening to a lot of crazy stuff. I used to listen to Genesis and and oh, yeah, uh, prog rock, a lot of the progressive bands and stuff too. ELP, um, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, all those guys. The and, reason I'm asking you what 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 you're listening to is when you go in and watch this band uh, as a 15 year old kid. Do you, do, one, do you remember what songs they played? And two, did you think they were any good? Uh, you know, at 15, it was easy to be blown away, but I kind of knew that these, these guys were just amazing. Uh, I mean, they were still raw. Yeah. Um, they didn't have a huge rapport of, of original material. So they're playing covers like early Van Halen was doing. Uh, some. Not so much covers. They, they actually had a lot of original stuff. They'd throw in a cover tune from time to time. And did they sound like uh, like uh, Sweet and stuff like that? Like that seven? Because, of course, that's what they become later. Uh, when you see the first Quiet Riot before Randy quits those Japanese records. Yeah, and, you and know. a lot of the influence that was on the original band is you know when they became like a starwood and whiskey a go-go band uh was influenced a lot by management management really kind of drove the direction they were going right uh they were a jeans and t-shirt group you know the the uh the the polka dot and the vest and the the stripes for that Canada kind of new york dolls and look the the but it wasn't even that because the new york dolls were even a bit more raw yeah you know it was it was a polished glam look kind totally of thing. And that was really kind of driven by management. They really wanted them to, to, to have this different image than, you know, they had originally got signed as. And uh, uh, the, the um, you know, through the years, I mean, the, the, the difference as the band progressed in terms of, you know, performance and, and the stage show being choreographed and not looking like it was. And, and right. uh, there was, I mean, there was a lot of spontaneity to stuff. But there was a lot of stuff that was rehearsed. There was a lot of moves that were rehearsed as, as things went on. But originally, the band was really raw. It was almost all original stuff that, yeah. that they were doing. But uh, not a whole lot of it saw the light of day. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, one of the songs was like Back to the Coast, which came out. Or it was West Coast Tryouts, which became Back to the Coast. Uh, there was a song that uh, we cut on the original uh, three, uh, three uh, uh, title uh uh, record the demo record uh there's uh this is west coast tryout suicidal show and um just how you want it right and when i started uh when i started with the guys as, as a roadie they didn't even have a title for just how you want it they were just called c and g because it was the chords yeah you know? so you're in there you watch him play. How long are you in for the first day? Like an hour, 15, uh, 20 minutes? I was, I was probably there like an hour or so and then, hanging out. And, and how, do you, how does it end? You go, hey, man, you're fucking great. Can we come see you again or that, something? That was, that was pretty much it. You know, I, I got in there, and, and uh, I, I was blown away. My buddy that I was with was blown away. Um, you know, we, we shook hands, and, hey, you know, when are you guys back here, man? I'd love to come watch you some more. And... Uh, we, you know, they kind of let us know when they were there, and then, you know, hey, you're welcome to come back, and uh, and I did, and you know, I'm, you know, the the uh, the, the term roadie, I've I've always maintained that the term roadie is, is has another meaning, which is frustrated musician. Right. Because uh, are you in a band at the time, or trying to be I, a? I was. I had played in a band in junior high. I had played in a band in high school. Uh, L.A. kid grew up in L.A. Uh, I started out here in the Valley. I went to Hollywood High for a while. Um, I mean, the, the, a lot of the kids I grew up with, I, some of the, some of the guys that are roadies still play. Uh, one of one of the girls who was my neighbor, who you know, I, I play. She played keyboards with me once or twice. Lisa Coleman from Prince's band. Wow, yeah. And uh, she lived up in Hollywood Hills, right next to my old man. Um, Your dad lived in the hills. Yeah, yeah. Was he loaded? Uh, you know the house that's the castle up there. Which one? Hollywood Castle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's up on Beechwood. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Wow. No so, shit. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. I, I love that spot. Your yeah, dad lived there? He built it. He built it? He built it, yeah. Holy shit. What year did he build that? Uh, it was like 1977. We were putting up the original structure. Did you grow up in there? Uh, well, actually, I had a house. My dad had... Uh, I moved back and forth between my dad and my mom. I was kind of a problem child. Yeah, uh, badass. <laughs> the um, yeah, I got kicked out of a couple schools. Ended up going to school in Hollywood. 
Uh, my dad actually had a house that was down just below that. That he, before he, the gates. He, uh, yeah, and he was uh, he was a little bit eccentric. He used to like build things and forget to do stuff like get permits to do it. Oh. Um, he we had a house on a hill, and he actually like opened up a hatch in the bottom of it and ended up building like this half size cabin cruiser underneath and wow came my room wow um, you know now what'd your dad do for a living uh he used to be in the clothing business he we were wholesale clothing jobbers and uh uh he would uh, do factoring for people basically make loans for people that would have a hard time getting loans wait he was a loan shark uh he I <laughs> charged a higher rent. Oh, man. You know, kind of, but no, he, he, he would factor stuff, you know, just like uh, places uh, car dealers floor their inventory. Oh, yeah, I got you. Yep. You know, basically, he would, uh, and, and we were in the clothing business, and we would buy like big closeouts and stuff. And, yeah. And, you know, it's uh, the, the uh, so it was. Uh, Let me ask you something, because uh, I just lived 13 years in Beachwood. It's my favorite neighborhood on the planet. What was Beachwood like back then? Because it is such a great neighborhood, but now it's un, un, unobtainable unless you're rich. But back then, what kind of people lived there? Was it blue collar? Was it, um, it middle class? It was still, um, I mean, you had your selection of people that were kind of the higher middle end. I mean, my dad bought his first house up there. Uh, God, it was, I want to say 74 five maybe 74 and for a house up on a hill it was two stories uh mm -hmm. maybe two thousand square feet when he got it uh i, I remember he paid like i think it was sixty five thou. wow you know I yeah mean, and uh, the let's, house is a million dollars plus now oh easily let's tell people it's where if uh people are wondering what we're talking about it's underneath the hollywood sign and uh and, and it's an incredible neighborhood loaded with a lot of uh, uh, musicians, actors, and uh, comedians, and, uh, and writers, and everything. It's, it's, it's hippie without being hippie, you know? It, it's, uh, it's just cool up there. The neighborhood, uh, aside from, you know, who's living there these days... Yeah. ...has not changed. Not at all. It's that crazy. That supermarket up there... Uh, that's is, been I th there forever. I think it's one of the coolest things in L.A., it's like a supermarket from that movie Drugstore Cowboy, like in the 50s. There's no yeah. one in there. I, I, uh, it was really interesting when I was in like junior high. You know, yeah. I, I would take the bus up, get off in front of the grocery store there, and my dad would spend a lot of time out. My stepmother, you know, my stepmother made reservations for dinner. Yeah. So, you know, my dad was, yeah, fend for yourself. And, you know, here, I got an account at the grocery store. Just go in there and get something. And I would walk in every day and I would say, I will take a T-bone steak and a potato. And we had like one of the first microwaves. So I'd throw the potato in, throw the T-bone on the grill. Yeah. And I had steak and potatoes for, for, uh, for dinner every night as a kid. And they got that diner right there, you know? Yeah, the di diner's been there forever, too. It's man. insane. It's and then incredible. there's an antique store there, you know? Yeah. And, and, and when I first moved to L.A., that's really where you would go secretly to look at the billboard for guest houses for rent and stuff. There was a yeah. billboard there for the neighborhood. And it, 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 you would just go up and go, oh, here's one for rent right here. And, and now that's, that's uh, Secrets way out, you know? Yeah. My, my old man used to throw a lot of parties, especially when we built the castle. He'd throw a lot of parties. And, and uh, uh, it was kind of funny because every once in a while we'd get the local constabulary would, uh, you know, come up to check things out. We weren't out of hand. It was just neighbors complaining about the parking. Yeah. And it was, it was funny because one day it was, uh, uh, he was throwing a fundraiser for somebody. And uh, L our, our you know LAPD showed up, and they, they would, we want to see the owner, and uh, he was standing next to his guests, and and uh, the police walked up, and you the owner, and yeah, I'm the owner, I'm Chuck Friedman. Have you met Governor Brown, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> and that was his first time in office. Wow. Yeah. And uh, wow. yeah, so he was there with the governor. Said, oh, thank you very much. Have a good night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, uh, who owns the castle now? Did he sell it, pass away? Uh, What's going it, on? Uh, my father passed away about 15 years ago. The castle is held in family trust. Oh, wow. Uh, currently, my half-brother is residing there with his wife. He 
uh, he married uh, uh, one of the girls, one of the America's top model girls. Oh wow! Um, wow! So your dad uh, got remarried and had some more kids. Uh, my my dad, uh, my mother was his second wife. My stepmother was his third. Uh, two kids with my mom, two with my stepmom. Right. Uh, so I, I have a half brother, half sister, and and my brother, who uh, he he does real estate up here. So so you start. You, you're, you're, you're a rock and roller, of course, same with me in the 70s, and you, uh, you, you're, uh, I mean, it's, it's standard, you know, problem child. School's boring once you find rock, right? Oh, yeah. You just can't take school once rock and roll's in your fucking head. <laughs> and so you start hanging out, you're going back and back to the quiet riot hangout, and all of a sudden, you eventually start working with him. I was talking to Billy from this, uh, Billy from Rock and Roll Relics and, and Jet Boy, a good friend of mine. And when we were young, too, really being a roadie, which I, I, I was never really a roadie. I would just help carry amps and stuff so I could get into the shows free. And I did it a lot for, like, Vicious Rumors, this other band, um, uh, I forget their name, uh, Roadrunner. And a few other bands in the Bay Area. Uh, but you really, once you become a roadie or carrying gear and stuff, you really learn rock and roll inside and out, right? You do, yeah, you know that, what's the movie with the 15-year-old kid who goes... Almost like, famous. Yeah, that's my life. Yeah, you know, I me mean, too. I, they didn't write it about me, but the, I, I did that. Yeah, me too, man. And uh, the, um, you know, uh, it, it didn't take long me hanging with the guys that they said, uh, you know, hey, the kid knows what he's doing. Uh, he knows how to plug stuff in. He knows how to put strings on a guitar. Um, hey, you want to be a roadie? Yeah. Uh, now, are you the only roadie for the band? Uh, for for a little while. Well, I was basically the only one that was consistent for about four and a half years. And your buddy didn't come around anymore? Uh, he he worked with me on a couple of the first gigs, and, and a couple of the early gigs said, man, they'd really gotten crazy. So oh, yeah? Like, what was, was going on? Oh, well, you know, it used to be a club out here, and I don't you, You've been in, in, in L.A. how long? Well, I know L.A. inside and out all my life. Well, FM Station, what club are you talking about? Th th there used to be a club up on Oxnard. It was actually more of a bar. It was a biker bar. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was called the Rock Corporation. Oh, and, I don't know. That's and cool. And it that. had a pretty seedy reputation as it was, man. People getting arrested there. People, yeah. People getting in fights there. And, and uh, our, our first manager, he had... Uh, booked us into the rock corporation and i said hey, we're gonna get you guys in here and we were opening opening up for this band called rock x uh -huh. and now rock corporation was a biker bar yeah and rock x was a biker band yeah that quite, classic quite, biker quite, quite right was not by the way right yeah and, and the biker the, band would be like they'd play some skinnered covers uh, and maybe do some grateful dead long jam stuff or or born to be wild was, shit like that yeah, right more, more stuff like that and they just didn't have the same look you know? right gotcha i mean you got a bunch of skinny rockers up here versus a bunch of dudes with beards and long yeah, hair yeah headband and, 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 yeah, yeah and 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 uh uh, so we, we go to play the club and, and the guy who's running the PA is another biker yeah. and, and, you know, Hey, I used to race motorcycles, so I got no problem with bikers. They're, they're, they're all good dudes. Yeah. But, uh, so we're in this biker bar and, uh, the, uh, the guy running the PA, I don't think he's really adept at doing stuff. And he, he kind of had the gain set way too high on Kevin's mic. Yeah. It's just and feeding it, back. It is not so much feeding back, but every time Kevin would do, you know, one of his like Steve Marriott kind of screams into the microphone and yeah. they just break the whole P up and distort. And, and the guy would freak out and he kept pulling the level down and he, kept, he shut off Kevin like five, six times during the first half of the set. And, uh, Kevin got really pissed off, and he had a little quarter-inch adapter somewhere that we had, and uh, he unplugged the mic from the sound box, from the snake box on a stage, walked over to Randy's amp, plugged it in, says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, we can't keep playing for you tonight, says, because the asshole running the PA keeps oh, turning, oh. and the guy, dude, lost it, man. Yeah. Kevin was always very opinionated. <laughs> um, he, uh, so anyways, Kevin says, the asshole running the PA won't let us, pull. you know, he kept turning me off, and and the guy running the PA was a little touchy on the subject. Yep. He lost it. He jumped up from behind the PA, and he uh, charged the stage with, he grabbed the first thing he could find, which was a, a big 
glass pitcher of beer. Yeah, like a stein. Yeah, a great big, huge. I mean, the thing weighed like 10 pounds. It was crazy. And a guy runs up, throws the beer at Kevin, and Kevin managed to, du- to, to miss it, which pissed the guy off even more, I guess. Yeah. And at that point, I was starting to break down. I was on one side of the stage. And, and I, you're 15. I was 15, man. I'm yeah. in a biker bar. Yeah. I'm 15. And I see the guy vault himself up onto the stage and raise the pitcher up like he's going after Kevin. And I just jumped from across the stage and I tackled him. Really? And I, I brought the guy. To, I'm not little, man. I'm, yeah. I'm like twice yeah. your size. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're a big dude. And I was, I was 300 pounds back then. You were? I, I was 280 pounds. At 15? At 15, 280. Wow. And, you know, I'm, I'm bigger now. I got a little bit of middle age spread here going yeah, on. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so... I tackled the guy. Yeah. And the guy brought the pitcher down on my head. Wow. And I was out cold for two, three seconds. But when I came down, I landed on him. I I took him down hard. And the uh, everybody kind of looked at me for a second. And and the bass player and my buddy who had originally gone to the uh, rehearsal with uh, is he, he runs a bar down in Texas now is Greg Weiner. Uh, I haven't talked to him for years, but uh, they were down on the stage. He was 15 too, by the way. Yeah. Um, Kelly was only 17. Bass player's only 17. Wow. Nobody was supposed to be in the bar. How old was Randy at the time? Randy was 18. Wow. I met the guys. Kelly was 17. Randy was 18. I think Drew had just maybe turned 19. And Kevin was and 40. Kevin was the old man at, 20, <laughs> at, at 21. 21. He just, just turned 21. So... Um, the uh, I, I like snapped out of it real quick and I pushed myself off this guy and my, my buddy Greg and Kelly were on the on the dance floor in front of the stage and they grabbed the guy by the arms yanked him out from under me dropped him down on his head wow um, and he was out cold yeah and between me and them and I got up and some other guy had I guess the guy's assistant jumped up on the stage and he was going after Kevin who was, you know, he's six foot three and 160 pounds. Yeah. And he's hiding behind his mic stand almost effectively, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. He's got the mic stand. He's trying to keep it out in front of him. And the guy is trying to get his hands on him and and got his fist drawn back. And, and I, I jumped up and, and shook it off for a second and came up behind the guy, grabbed him, put him in a full Nelson, picked him up off the ground and and basically just look motherfucker all we want to do is get out of here yeah. get off my stage wow and i threw him into the audience wow now we were not a biker band in a biker bar and and to this day it is my contention that the only reason we came out of there alive is because i amused these guys yeah yeah <laughs> but, yeah 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 They're like, this is funny <laughs> and, yeah you know, and I'm, uh, and and they're they're all looking at me, going, "Man, Harold, are you all right?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And I, I had a lump on my head the size of a cantaloupe. Let's and, uh, let, let's let's get into a little bit of uh, Randy. Like when you first see him that first day, because Randy's a different player in Quiet Riot, of course, compared to uh, once he gets into Ozzy. Now, when he is playing in Quiet Riot, uh, are you? Do you see shades of like, wow, this guy's next level? Or is he just like, because back then it uh, seemed like a lot of guys were fucking great on guitar. He was, I mean, you know, I had been listening to, you know, like Iommi and, yeah. and Mark Farner and, you know, the Iron, Iron Butterfly. And, you know, I, I, I'd been listening to like, you know, a lot of the guys that were considered more heavy and a lot yeah. of the, the guitar gods and, and. You know, and, and, you know, looking back on stuff and there are guys out there that were like, you know, really visionaries and really ahead of their time. And there were guys out there that were playing blues scales. Right. And, um, and, and you can sound great playing a blues scale, man. You just, you got to play it right. Yeah. Like, major E scale, stuff like that. Yeah. And Randy was just playing stuff way beyond that. He was. Even back then, huh? Even back then. And it was, it was not so much of, um, the 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 what he played as as so much as how he played it right um you know he he could milk a note for everything it was worth and it wasn't all about being fast which he was yeah but it was about playing the right note at the right time and he just had this uncanny sense i mean there's there's musicians out there uh there are guys that translate things into music and there are guys that just think music so we're we're talking seventy five still, right? Yeah. Um, 
Eddie Van Halen doesn't come out till '77, but Eddie's around at the time. Yeah, Ed, and, Eddie and are you and, are you uh, seeing Eddie at all? Like, uh, no, it was actually kind of weird. I mean, because the only time you know, uh, uh, Van Halen was a Pasadena band. I think in '75 they were correct. still Mammoth. Yep, and uh, they were they were this Pasadena band. Quite right, it was a Burbank band, and. Really, there was no sense of rivalry, even at the point until you know when when uh, the guys started getting signed. Right, uh, Quiet Riot actually got we got a record deal in 1976. The Japanese deal? No, actually, it was before that. We got signed to Buddha Records, and then 30 days later, Buddha went BK. Oh wow! Buddha went belly up, man. It was. That's wow. kind of ironic, isn't it? Yeah. Buddha yeah. Went belly, up. <laughs> belly up. Belly up. Wow. But, uh, yeah, Buddha went bankrupt right after they sang Quiet Riot, and, and they had actually put us in the studio, and then they were gone. And wow. so we recorded the Quiet Riot 1 in the studio, and had a record in the can and nowhere to go with it well they got a business so you got a free record and uh yeah yeah i got it here man i got a signed copy here no shit no shit wow now i want to look at that when we're done well um, now well, now one of the things i really wanted to ask you too is when you go into that uh studio that day the rehearsal studio what what amp is randy playing do you remember Oh, I, I know exactly man because you know I'm, I'm i'm kind of a gearhead so. yeah me too that's yeah. uh you know, I, I can tell you what everybody had. It was uh, Randy had, he had always used Altec speakers. Really? Uh, at least so from the time I was with That's him. That's the silver cone he ones? Had, yeah, the silver cone, big white baskets yep. on the back with totally. the gray uh, magnet cover. Totally. Um, and they weighed like a ton. Yeah. Uh, but he was playing through a 212 sun cabinet. Wow, 212 sun cabinet. 212 sun cabinet, and he had the, the same PV head that he had basically through all Quiet Riot. PV head. It was this old PV head that like the one Skinner used, like the brown ones. Man, no, it was uh, it was a, it was a transistor head. Wow. And he had to work like crazy to get like his tone out of that stuff. Now, why um, did he not never get a Marshall? Was he just broke? Randy was like a struggling musician. You know, he he taught guitar. Yep. Um, I mean, he. A lot of people remember him as as like being a rock god. And, yeah, yeah. You know, the thing is, I don't think he 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 wouldn't have appreciated that much as much as being remembered as as a teacher. You know, I get that, but it's it's amazing to think about like when I uh, played music or whatever. I would do whatever it took to get the best gear because later Randy yeah. is known for that the killer white Marshall and the black oh, yeah, Marshall, yeah. And the Les Paul cream Les Paul, the, and of course his Concord V and the Jackson V. Oh man, there's tons of story behind that because you know we did the first couple of gigs with that SG. Yeah. Um, the um, now that SG is a piece of shit, the, and, and the you SG, bring your guitar uh, around. Well, now there's pictures of your guitar, Randy playing it, there's right? There's pictures of a couple of my guitars because you know I, I you know, like I said I kind of grew up with you know not too bad of circumstances so i had a lot more free cash than he did you yeah know? um the uh was one of those cases where the roadies just you know had more money but well, well that's a lot of the, in the 70s and 80s it was coke dealers and stuff that hung around that had a lot more money and they were just fun bands like yeah and no, no, that, that, that's kind of a whole different subject oh totally because that's uh but uh it was it was about the time we did the the uh we, we played two gigs at the Rock Corporation. A lot of people think we only played one. I distinctly remember we did two, and it was the second one, of course, we got in a big fight at. Uh, the, uh, the next big show that we did uh, would have been um, the, the Machinist Hall at Burbank. Wow. And I believe there's a Ralph's Market that stands on that spot now. Wow, all right. Uh, that's that's kind of like hallowed ground, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, but that, that show, they kind of made the mistake of... of self-promoting and not hiring any security oh wow and yeah. it was kind of a cluster one of those ones where you just rent the hall and throw a gig we rented the hall rented the stage in there and threw the gig and oh my god it turned into a cluster yeah it was it was bad um now they're not playing clubs at all yet huh like they're not doing no, like man, the whiskey Star or anything starwood stuff did not come around until they changed managers right uh because under it was magic wand was the original uh label for the management company and the the little demo disc that we put out and uh 
that was uh, Dennis Wageman yeah. that uh, did that. And he owned, uh, it was called Camino Heating and Air, which is now long gone. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, you know, he's supposedly financing the band from the uh, Camino Heating and Air. Um, but there was, uh, and, and, you know, I, I won't say anything because I never saw anything in front of me. Yeah. But, I mean, that was in the days of a lot of white powder. Of course, yeah. So. I had Vicki Hamilton on last week, and she said she never saw anybody do more blow than Kevin DeBrow one night. Uh, you know, it, that's that's really ironic because, well, first of all, that's what killed Kevin. Of course, I know. And, um, Total bummer. And uh, But Kevin was the teetotaler out of the band. Back in the day? Back in the day, man. Kevin would not touch. He wouldn't even have a drink. No shit, huh? Yeah, it was, it was, he was just totally as straight-laced as could be when it came to you know, being impaired or anything, man. He just wanted no part of it. Wow. And so That's incredible. And, and, and I really hadn't talked to him for years and years after, uh, you know, after Randy was gone. I, I, the, the last time I really talked to him was like in his apartment and it was after Randy had left with Ozzy. And I think it was like the second time, this for the second album. Yeah. And I'd gone there and, and uh, Kevin had actually given me some video footage on a VHS tape from, back in the day and and brandy happened to have called when i was there and i it was the last time i got to talk to him wow but it was and it was kind of funny as i got to tease him because he had picked up an english accent from being there so long oh yeah <laughs> yeah people do that it's it's it funny was, uh, yeah it was really funny hey mate you know you're like who the fuck is this you know you now you're working with randy you're you are you a full band roadie or do you just become randy's roadie what happens i i did everything yeah and you're just kind of like the fucking guy well stage manager style i was pretty much the only one that was consistent yeah uh i I, i've had a lot of guys that come in come in and out with me uh uh, was mario salinas he's a good buddy of mine from high school uh he ended up going out and touring with uh he he picked up uh, Blondie's first tour in the U.S. Right, and she was like opening for Iggy Pop. And when Blondie dropped out, he ended up staying on with Iggy. And then Iggy ended up opening for Bowie, and he stayed on with Bowie. Well, I just had Iggy and, Soundman on. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm putting it on with this episode. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, it's basically kind yeah. of a roadie. Uh, Slash later on technician yeah. uh, episode. Gotta so, ask him if he remembers Mario. He was back there that long. Well, ago. I already did it a couple of days yeah. ago. I had yeah, him on. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I mean, Mar, Mar, my buddy Mario, he roadied for a bunch of other people going down the road. Uh, buddy of mine, Alan Hirschberg, who ended up uh, becoming an engineer and producer, and uh, I think he got a Grammy for like redoing Conjunction Junction. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> Schoolhouse yeah, Rock yeah. thing. He, What's your function? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So and, when do you start seeing Quiet Right start to get big? How many years were you with him? Uh, I was with him from like 1975 to the very beginning of about 1979. Wow. Uh, I was with them through the whole phase where they had Kelly Garney, which kind of ended in June of 78. Uh, we were in the middle of recording the second album when Kelly got the boot from that, which is a whole other story. What do you get booted for? Oh, him and Randy got in a fight over the usual thing, which was Kevin. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, because they, Kevin and Kelly could not stand each other. Yeah. And it was kind of sad because later on after the band and when Kevin moved out to Vegas and Kelly's living out in Vegas, Kelly's running a, a, a coffee shop and art uh, a store and he does his own artwork now and he's really talented at his art and he still plays bass. Yeah. And I, I keep in touch with him. And... Uh, and he became good friends with Kevin after well, that, everything. That, that makes sense. I mean, but a as, lot of times, you know, when you're... Bandmates, yeah, man, when you, they yeah. were at each other's throat. And there was times when they just, they were on the floor rolling around and duking it out. Wow. And uh, so Kelly basically got picked out, kicked out of the band. It was like two days before our biggest gig ever that to that point. It was, yeah. We were opening for Angel. Angel, who wow. Was, who was on the same management company as us toby that, toby organization management that's pretty cool angel uh, yeah they, they, that's a band a lot of people don't know yeah they, they were the antithesis of kiss yeah yeah kiss was all black and angel was all white yeah um yeah so they there's were some people that are just like angel oh, freaks and, and if you t- 
turned the album upside down, it read the same back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, so that was their, their little thing with their logo. Um, Where was this gig going to be? Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. Well, great room. And they were doing a live 24 track. Right. And so they had pulled up, I forget, a record plant or Hyder's truck or something. I can't remember who the studio was, but uh, the, the Angels Road manager was Bill Sherrick, and they came to me and they said, you know, we got really, really specific. You know, your set is 35 minutes long, no encore. Yeah. And, of course, the guys pushed it out to, like, 45 and then came back on. And Sherrick's, Harold, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, like, I can't do any dive. They're up there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that they, old one. <laughs> they are. Uh, yeah, he was really pissed. He was. He was Kiss's road manager too at the time. I think. Wow. And uh, yeah. So, but uh, it was like two days before that gig, and we're gonna we're playing in front of three thousand people at pretty much a sold out show, and Kelly and Randy get in this knockdown down drag out fight over kevin and it wasn't so much that it was the knockdown drag out because they were like brothers they did that from time to time yeah yeah and the uh, randy would throw some blows oh yeah yeah, Whoa. yeah they, he they, never seemed like a guy like that right yeah, he seems so soft like they, this little he, creature well, he was like 125 pounds I know, soaking a, wet, so yeah. um but yeah they they actually it's it, they didn't throw blows at first kelly had been drinking quite a bit and uh uh, they got in this fight, and Kelly collected firearms at the time. Whoa. And he pulled out a forty four Magnum and <laughs> fired it over Randy's head. Whoa. It blew a hole in the wall. Ooh. and At the studio? And it, this is at Kelly's house. He had a little house. It was like a back room. It was out on Victory Boulevard, right off of Van Nuys Boulevard. That's fucking like crazy. Before they had gone to all businesses on that street. Yeah. You know? And, it, and uh, it was like in the back, and it, it blew a hole in the wall. It made a huge sound. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, 44. And, and then, of course, instead of running away, Randy did what anybody else would do, which is they jumped on each other. They punched it out. Randy ended up with the black eye. They both ended up with black eyes. The next night when they, when they did the show, they were like, they both wearing makeup to cover black eyes. Wow. Um, the, uh, but the result was Randy left and the neighbors had called again, the local constabulary LAPD yeah. shows up as Kelly is walking out. He's got his gun with him. It's loaded. He's fired at once. Uh, and he's drunk as a skunk and he goes to get in his car and drive away. And that's when they pulled up and stopped him. Wow. And, uh, so they arrested him for, for a Dewey and then he got charged with discharging a firearm, loaded weapon, uh, the whole bit. Um, I get a phone call the next morning. That was June, 1978. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my birthday is in March. I turned 18 in March. Yeah. I, my birthday is the day before Randy was killed in the plane crash. Oh, bummer, my, man. March 18th. Randy's killed March 19th. Terrible. I was celebrating my 22nd birthday. The next day, I got a phone call that Randy had wow. been killed. But, uh, so it's June. It's 1978. I'm barely 18 years old. I get a phone call from, from Kelly's girlfriend, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, and says, Kelly's in jail. I said, what the hell do you mean Kelly's in jail? We have a gig tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah. And she says, Kelly's in jail. I got in a fight with Randy, and, and he's in jail. And so I, I called up Randy, and I called up Kevin, and, and Randy was none too happy. Kevin was just really pissed. Um, and they were like, well, I can't do anything about it. You know, you check and see what the bail is. And I called up, I called up the jail, and I found out, and it was $500. Well, and shit. <laughs> I, I called up, I, I said, okay, was anybody called management? Well, I talked, to, I talked to management. Kevin talked to management. And I said, well, are they doing it? Well, I don't know yet. And I, yeah. I called up. I called up management, and you know, there's two managers, da David Josephs, who was a very staunch Englishman, yeah, and Warren Entner, who used to be in the grassroots. Wow. And uh, anyway, so I, I call up, and I'm going, you know, please let it be Warren that answers, because he was much more reasonable. Right. And I called up, and of course, I got David. Yeah. And David was not happy with the situation at all. I mean, really less than happy. I said, David, have you, this is Harold, you know, um, Kelly's in jail. Says, yeah, I've heard. And, 
I said, well, I, you know, we have the. Sh-. He says he can fucking rot. You wow. Know? And he was just not happy. Yeah. Um, and I said, we got the show Angel, 3,000 people, big exposure. Got to get And him I'm out. trying to sell the to sell getting Kelly out of jail. Yeah, yeah. And he says, well, have, have you called and found out how much bail is? And I said, yeah, it's $500. And he says, I'll give you 50. You figure it out. Whoa. And so, he was not happy. Yeah. yeah and it's $500, not bad bail for, you know, even yeah, back right? then. Firearm for, and drunk driving. <laughs> for those charges. So anyways, I, I drove out to get the money from, from uh, the management company out to Beverly Hills, driving out from the San Fernando Valley out to Beverly Hills, drive back, go over, and I'm trying to figure out now what I'm going to do to get Kelly out of jail because I've got 50 and I need 500. Yeah, you need 450 now. I, I need 450 <laughs> more or I need some collateral. And, okay, reminder again, I'm 18 years old. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, um, he's got the base, but he needs that for tomorrow. Yep. Um, he's, got, uh, he's got all these guns. He's got oh. these gun coll- this gun collection. Yep. And I said, I'm going to go knock on the door and see if I can get Kathy to give me the guns because I'm just trying to use those as collateral. Yeah. And, of course, I go knock on the door and there's nobody there. So I had to kick the door open. I stole all Kelly's guns. Yeah. And yeah, I found a bail bondsman that would take him for collateral. Unbelievable. I walked in with my 50 bucks and an armload of rifles. Yeah. And Uh, I said, man, I got to bail my friend out. I said, this is about $1,000 worth of rifles. Here, you take these on collateral. And they said, yeah, we'll do that. Wow. And uh, I I lucked out and I went over, got Kelly out of jail. And and, uh, he does the gig. He does the gig. And then they fire him. The very next night, they fired him because they they didn't want to do it beforehand. Oh, my God. Rock and uh, roll right there, right? Right? Yeah, rock and roll is is rough, man. Yeah, it is. It's real. Um, it's real. So, uh, anyways, yeah, so I, I get Kelly out of jail, and and the next day he's gone. Are you and, around when Randy starts get like when he gets that Les Paul and shit? Yeah, Randy got the Les Paul actually with the very first manager long before Toby organization. So by the time we did the the Machinist Hall gig, he had it. Yeah, we had done maybe. Two shows without it, and that was his becomes his main guitar. That became his his main and pretty much the only thing that he was playing uh, up until right after I left in '79. He got the Sandoval V, right? And, were, uh, uh, right after you left, he got the V. Real shortly after I left, because were you talking to him? Uh, but still, why did you leave? Uh, you know, I was eighteen. I had uh, You'd done it, gotten, right? I, I I was moving in with the girl yeah um, you know i got I, I got pictures of my paycheck studs and i'll show you man. i was making 15 bucks a night because you know wow we'd be there for you know 10 hours but get paid for like four or five yeah yeah and, you know, yeah mi- minimum wage back in the day was like four dollars oh something. so they were paying minimum wage uh technically if i you know i look on my checks i probably owe the irs money i was i was a private contractor right <laughs> you know it right. just says roadie fee for the night 15 dollars wow you know <laughs> My truck made more than I did. I got more mileage than I did in, ro- in pay. Just no fucking cash on that, huh? A straight management style? There's, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, but I, 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 I've, I've uh, you know, I'm paying for it these days. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got, I got these hearing aids. Wow. And, and uh, you know, my hearing rolls off at, uh, uh, it rolls off at like 1,500 cycles, and it's gone by 4K. Really? Yeah, it's, it's, there's so, nothing left there. So... When you're roadieing for the band, are you just sitting next to an amp or something, or where were I you? Was, j- depending on uh, who's, uh, whose side I was, uh, the stage I was on, I'd be either behind Randy's or, or Rudy's amplifiers or Kelly's amplifiers. Were you, uh, so I, after they fired Kelly, Rudy gets the gig? Uh, it was kind of interesting. It was we were in the middle of recording Quiet Riot Two. You're right. At uh, we were at Record Plant for that, and they, they, they had just had the fire back in 1978, so they're like rebuilding Record Plant, and they got us like some discount rate in there because like it was all smoky and yeah. there's still yeah. open beams and shit. charcoal studios. Was, yeah, there's, there's still walls that are charred, yeah. and yeah. and uh, so we went into the Record Plant, and the the sessions uh, up to that point because Kelly had recorded some of the bass tracks, and we were still only halfway through with the album. Yeah. And uh, Kelly was gone. When he gets fired, um, is he, does he go crazy? 
no, he just kind of disappeared for a while. Wow. He just kind of, he, he, you know, I, I got him. It's like one of those, uh, I, th I think he kind of had a vision in jail. I think it kind of. He's like, I got to get my shit together. It, it was the wake up call for him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he really pulled his life together after that. And, and uh, you know, I got to give him credit. And, and you know, I, I, I know he went through a difficult time and I, I know he fought a bottle for a while. But yeah. uh, Kelly's really gotten his shit together. He's turned into quite the artist. Um, and and he's he's still a great guy. I mean, he was he, him and Randy. Drew was a little standoffish. Um, Kevin could be quite obnoxious, and and uh, and Randy and Kelly were always like always upbeat and always had good shit to say. And and uh, you know, and, and as much as everybody was, you know, had their own little attitudes. You know, I I, I, I love the guys to death, all of them. You know, yeah. But, Rudy. Uh, now, how do they get Rudy? I, Rudy's been well, on the show twice, and Rudy, he's a great friend of mine. I absolutely think he's uh, probably. I think he, Rudy is Jesus. You know, he's a walking Jesus. <laughs> it's one of the nicest Rudy, people I've ever met. Yeah, Rudy came on actually after the album was in the can. Randy had recorded, right. finished most of the bass tracks oh, on wow. the album. Um, the uh, so he got his picture on the album. He didn't do the photo shoot until after they had settled on a bass player. And there's like one or two guys that uh, had auditioned in between. Uh, I, I know Nikki Six had auditioned at one. Really? Point. Yeah. Wow, I didn't even know that. Yeah, Randy said, "Please don't pick him. I don't want to teach him how to play." Wow. Um, he, no he shit. Was, huh? Yeah, he was not that good yet. So. Please don't pick him. Who he said that to? Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. Kevin's more. Yeah. He's more like, "Hey, he's tall." It's, yeah, he it'll... fits the image. Yeah, and, yeah, and, got and, yeah. And, No, he doesn't play that good. Right, right. Um, Rudy's a god. Know, and and uh, yeah, Rudy. Rudy's a great bass player. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh, he's, I never clicked with Rudy, you know? Really? I, I worked with him a handful of times. We did a couple of the club gigs, a couple of Starwoods, and, and I, yeah, there's probably a couple others somewhere else. The, the whiskey show, I think they only did like one or two whiskey shows, and they were both after I left. That was the one that they did the, the video of. What's, no, which video did they do? Uh, no, they, they, the very last gig that Quiet Riot did in 1979 as a band, uh -huh. uh, they brought in, uh, I think it was a Mobile 16 and a, uh, and a video production. Wow. And they shot the whole thing. Wow. And the, Is that around? Did it who, come out? I have no idea where the footage is. Shit. Uh, there, there is... There, actually, you know, there, there is footage of it. It's like a bootleg disc, you, a bootleg DVD that you can right, get now. Right. But I have no idea who actually has it. So. Yeah. Now, after you leave '79, band cr falls apart. Like what? A year, uh, six months after you leave. Uh, Randy left, and they basically fell directly right. apart. There, there was uh, Kevin had kind of put stuff back together, but he put it back together Dubrow. as Dubro. Right. Um, the, uh, the name Quiet Riot did not reemerge until after Randy's success with Ozzy. Of course. And everybody was asking, hey, where, the, where did this guy come from? I mean, we used to play in a band called Quiet Riot. Right. And all of a sudden, the name of Dubrow changes back to Quiet Riot. Yeah, yeah, of course. And you got some glory going on. Yeah, now. so, um, you know, Ke Kevin didn't know how to capitalize on things. Yeah. You know? But uh, the... Um, yeah, the band was never the same. It, it, to me, it was just kind of weird, and I, I could still accept it as Quiet Riot when, when uh, you know, Kevin was still singing with them. But, I mean, there's not one single original person left that was Quiet Riot as I knew it. So. Oh, you mean right now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. Know, Frankie was with Kevin from day one, but yep. that wasn't Randy's band. Right. Now... Uh, when Randy gets the gig with Ozzy, are you still talking to Randy? Do you call him once in a while? I had only on? talked to him a couple of times after yeah. that. You know, I talked to him once in the UK. I talked to him once when he was home from uh, in between tours. But we really didn't have a whole lot of time to catch up. Now, when you, when you hear the record, are you blown away when you hear Blizzard of Oz? Like, oh, my God. Because um, a lot of people say, and um, I, I've asked some people, and I think I asked Kelly, his brother, a lot of people say that Eddie and, 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 you know, was really like a button for Randy of like, I've got to smoke him, you know? Nah. No? It didn't happen. No. Didn't happen. I mean, there was, 
there was a crosstown fan rivalry. Yeah. It was, our band is better from Pasadena. No, our band is better from Burbank. Yeah, yeah. I, I really don't think that there was, there was no animosity there. No, not animosity. Um, I'm just there, saying there was, that's there, how his there playing really got. really wasn't, so, I, I, I never saw any sense of competition, and there really wasn't much acknowledgement about Eddie. Um, you know, the, the, the you know, not many people realize we did do one show together. Oh, really? Glendale Civic Auditorium or, yeah, Glendale College Auditorium, Civic Auditorium, something like that, uh, up, up, up in Glendale. And it was uh, uh, 1977. It was with Toby Organization Management. There's, right. there's uh, some crazy pictures from backstage. There's some of them are in Ron Sobel's book. Uh, the guys, the guys' dressing room was like right next to the props department in the college auditorium, and I think they were like doing Gone with the Wind or something. And all the guys ended up in dresses, yeah, in like the you know, 1860s, and yeah, yeah, and they grabbed Warren and they threw a dress on Warren, and and uh, it was it was all fun. Uh, the um, but that was we played with uh, we played with Van Halen that day, and it was really interesting because there was so much fan rivalry yeah that it was like a thousand seat hall yeah and they sold all thousand tickets whoa and about 500 quiet riot fans bought tickets and 500 van halen fans bought tickets and for quiet riot about 500 people came in and then left wow and then 500 people came in to see van halen it was like we'll wait till our band's on that's a, yeah that's it, was, it was like and i was like Man, and, 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 you know, at the time, you know... If you would have went in, you would have saw an incredible show. You would have seen probably the two guitar gods of the, 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 yeah. the decade playing on the same bill. A lifetime, you and, know? It's yeah. like Hendrix and Clapton or something. And, yeah, you know? and uh, it, it, was, it was just kind of funny because there's just so much rivalry. Like, half the audience walked out in between. Wow. It was, uh, it was really funny. Uh, the, um, yeah, that was like the only one that they had ever shared the the same venue at the same time, you know, it was, uh, and it was, it was a crazy gig. It was, you know, yeah, a yeah. lot of them, a lot of them were crazy. We, we did, uh, oh, there was like the, we, we did a, uh, opening thing with, uh, Journey when, uh, Journey had just started. No got shit. Going. Without yeah. Steve Perry, it was the Greg with, Raleigh era. It was the Greg, it was Greg Raleigh. It was Ainsley Dunbar. Yeah. The green record, the psychedelic. Neil Schoen. And for my understanding was that Steve Perry had joined the band at that point, but he wasn't able to tour with them yet. Wow. And so um, it was really interesting because there's some very interesting personalities in that band. And, and uh, Ainsley Dunbar was just the nicest guy that could ever be. I mean, he was just like totally upbeat. And I'm, I'm standing there in between sound checks and Ainsley's just tweaking his drum set out. And, uh, he, he looks over at me and says, have you seen my new drum riser yet? Man, my roadies built this thing for me and it's got these, I just dropped my cymbal stands right in here and they lock into place. And he's like all excited about it. It's like almost manic. He's so excited. Yeah. And it's like, I've never seen your old one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I don't I'm even... the roadies for the other band, dude. We've never played together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the, uh, on, on, on the other hand, uh, um, I, I got a buddy of mine worked a gig with me, and, and I, was, I was over at his house the other night because we just started keeping up again, and we were kind of comparing notes on a couple of the gigs, and I said, well, you remember what happened to, with Sean and me, right? And he says, no. I says, well, he says, was, was that the comment he made about the guitar picks? I says, wait a minute, guitar picks? What comment about the guitar picks? He says, he says somehow I managed to come up with the fact, you know, he said, well, why are you taping all the guitar picks up there? And he says, well, Randy goes through five or six guitar picks a night, you know, he tape a dozen or so up for him. Yeah. And, and Sean commented back something along the lines, well, that's a mark, not a mark of a bad guitar player, you know? And, <laughs> mark and, of a bad guitar player. Yeah, and then not to be outdone, and, and man, I remember this verbatim. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting there, and it's in between the, the, the sound check, and we're, we got downtime, and Sean had been playing backstage, snapped his high E string, and I am watching as he, he hands his guitar to his road manager, his guitar tech, same thing. Um, and he says, here, put a string on it. And the guy pulls a string out of an envelope. And I'm looking at the string, and he winds it up, and it snaps. Yeah. And he does it like three more times. And I'm looking, and I'm, I'm looking at the gauge on the string. If, you know, any guitar players out there, you know, he pulls, he's pulling out 
007 gauge string. Well, seven gauge string. Seven right. gauge, man. That's like that's two like, sizes smaller that's than the kid smallest. Stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah. Tens that's what people like, start at and go up to twelves, thirteens, tens. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I first started working with the band, Randy used nines. Yeah. And that was when he had the black SG. He was snapping them all the time. And he went up to a ten. Yeah. And when he did that, he says, you know, I I, I never break strings anymore i know i have better tone it, i've got you know and and so i decided that you know hey randy told you know this is what randy said so i, I said you know i says randy said that uh, you know, our guitar player says uh, he went up one gauge string he gets better tone never breaks strings anymore and sean looked over at me and he stared right at me he said what the fuck do you know you are just a dumb fucking roadie wow and wow. now, now he owes his life to Kelly Garney, by the way. Yeah. Because my my left hand shot yeah. out in front of me and I was reaching for his collar. Yeah, yeah. And my my right hand drew back. Yeah. And before I could grab on or take a swing, Kelly Garney is hanging off my right elbow. Wow. I mean hanging, literally hanging yeah. off the go, Harold, don't hit him, don't hit him, you'll kill him. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> and, yeah, it was. Yeah, so he owes his life to Kelly. I, I'm, I was gonna, and I'm fairly even tempered, but yeah, you know, I mean, it wasn't the insult to me; insulted Randy, you know. Yep. Uh, after, after, uh, quite right. You, you, you step out, and that's it. You're never back into rock and roll. What do you end up um, doing with your life? Well, I during quite right. I. Uh, I ended up getting kind of a reputation in the clubs. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing a lot of freelance stuff for people. Uh, there's a band, uh, there's a band called radio it was like, did some really cool stuff. They did a, uh, you know, everybody had to have a gimmick back then. Yeah. There's a band called radio lead singer's name was Ken. I don't remember anybody else's name, but in the middle of the set, they would like stop and he'd do like a five minute magic show. Oh my God. And the magic show was really funny because <laughs> oh. what he'd do is he'd turn the person that was, he'd like, get a volunteer from the audience, sit down in his chair. We're going to make this little wad of paper disappear. Yeah. And, and the person sitting there in, in, in the chair facing him. And of course it's all sleight of hand. And he'd make the paper disappear, he'd throw it over her head. Yeah. And so the whole audience is like busting up watching this. And the girl's going, that's amazing. Wow. He said, you want to do it again? Magic. Yeah. Rock. That's amazing. It was, it's like, and and uh, so that was their thing. I worked with a band called Hollywood Party Boys. Who, so you just worked with a bunch of bands. I worked with a bunch of bands. I, I, I did Milk and Cookies was, was Sal Meta from Roxy Music. Yeah. And uh, Luke Zamberini, who played with Sparks. Wow. Um, I, I, there's a bunch of stuff. I, my friend who was touring with Blondie, uh, I worked the, the first gig in L.A. for Blondie. It was Blondie and Tom Petty. Wow. So I, I helped him out on that one. And uh, Milk and Cookies, we were opening, we opened for the Ramones a couple times. Wow. That was, that was the funniest shit I'd ever heard. Yeah. Because that was, we were at the Whiskey for that one. And we're up on, my, my counterpart for the Ramones, his name was Arturo. And, you know, they, they, they all talk like they, 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 were, they were, you know, all New York, they, they were talking like this. And, and uh, it was Johnny Ramones up there, and, and he says, uh, he says, uh, it's during the sound check, and he's, he's, Arturo's up in the whiskey, and, the, you know, the, at the Whiskey A Go-Go, to adjust the, the, the par lights to the band, man, you just hang off the sound booth. Yeah. Yeah, you know, back in the day, you just reach out and adjust the lights. And so, so, uh. Uh, Johnny's up on a stage, they're doing their sound check. It's like their first out beat on the brat, whatever. And, and uh, uh, Arturo's up there adjusting lights. And, and Johnny says, Arturo, turn down the lights on the stage. I can't see the dots on my guitar. Oh. It's like, did I just hear that? <laughs> the dots on his you guitar. You can't see the dots? Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you're looking at the dots. Meanwhile, they're just murdering it, though, man, when they go. Yeah. Yeah, they were Fucking fun great. to watch, you know. Yeah, totally, totally. You know, it was, uh, it was, it was a blast back. There was, a, you know, it was the, the punk was just coming out, new wave was just coming out, rock and roll kind of was kind of like a, a, a crazy different place. It was. Um, I, I did do some stuff for other bands in the long run, but it was kind of like a, a more of a corporate thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I helped out a. a friend of my old man's who was managing a band and, and you, you mentioned the knack so i gotta throw it in. i had a friend of mine ed bowen over at freedom guitar now long retired but uh i used to get a lot of my gear through him and i i was working for this other band uh and and i said you know i says our guitar player wants one of these new mace amps that just came out yeah see if you can get me one and he says uh he says well he says they said it'll be six months 
And I said, hmm, tell him it's for the knack. Yeah. And he called him back, and he says, it'll be here in two weeks. Wow. <laughs> Amazing Boogie? Amazing Boogie? Yeah, it was a Mesa Boogie, the first ones. With yeah, the like the Mark 50, One. 50, yeah, the Mark yeah, One. Yeah, with the, the tweed kind the, of wood box. The and the I love equalizer those. and yeah, stuff. Yeah, kind of, kind of uh, Grateful yeah. Dead hippie looking, like a, almost an Olympic looking bass you yeah. know, uh, uh, amp, you know? Yeah. A uh, wood box with the fucking five... Q graphic. That's some good shit back yeah, then. Yeah, there was a cool little amp, but you know, I, I, I kind of knew how to work the system by then. Yeah, totally. Now, what do you end up doing for a living? Do you, do you didn't uh, spend your life in rock and roll. The reason I'm asking is because uh, Night Bob, the guy that I had on, um, who, who ended up doing sound for everyone, is still in the biz from when he yeah. was 17 years old. Um, well, I, I did a couple of different things. I, I started doing some... I, 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 I had my own lighting and sound company going when I was in school as well. Yeah. So I was doing some lighting and some sound, and, and uh, essentially that ended up as a tax write-off. Yep. I, I didn't pay taxes for like three years on account of that. Uh, the um, I, I moved from there. I started doing some like... Uh, custom home stereo installs crawl underneath houses but i'm kind of too big to crawl underneath houses. yeah yeah so that didn't really work out but i, I made a couple bucks during that uh I, I worked for my old man's company for a while doing the clothing and and uh driving trucks and and i used to be, you know drive bobtails i drive up and down the state and yeah and things and i, I ended up uh having some health problems i got sick i got I ended up with uh uh, I, I've got this liver thing called Jobert's that you know, every time I get sick, I turn yellow and people think I have hepatitis, which I don't. Right. Um, but uh, I ended up getting real sick and, and uh, it, it was times were kind of rough. So I kind of walked away from my old man's company. Um, uh, I'm, I'm working for a group called Avidex now. And yeah. We do like all high end boardrooms and conference rooms and oh, wow. video conferencing and stuff. So now you uh, we were talking before we started up. Uh, there's a couple projects you want to do. You want to try to get that guitar made, uh, like uh, have well, a version of your guitar that Randy played well, sometimes. L l let me let me tell you about that. You know, so basically, um, you know, the there's there's a couple of different books that that there's pictures of that in. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Klein's got a book that he published, Big Coffee Table Book. The unfortunately, the Rhodes family were none too happy with uh, either Klein or, uh, or or Ron Sobel in the wrong, long run, who was the band's photog uh they they apparently still love kelly garney so uh but uh you know we have a common friend up in, in san francisco and the guy's basically a boutique guitar manufacturer yeah, billy Rowe, and rock and Bill, roll relics. billy Rowe, rock and roll relics and, been on and, the show great friend and, old friend uh, of mine. super nice guy I've, I've been emailing him back and forth we've spoken on the phone a couple times finally met him in person the other day you know and i dropped off two of my babies to him so yeah. um anyways the uh uh, you know, so we've got a lot of documentation, you know, on, on the Quiet Riot, uh, uh, the Randy Rosier CD that was the posthumous release. Right. Uh, Kevin Dubrow has in the liner notes that Randy played my Strat on uh, the solo for Killer Girls. And, you know, Randy, if anybody is familiar with Randy's recording techniques, he was, uh, he loved double and triple tracking his rhythm tracks just to fatten stuff up. And rather than double or tri triple tracking with just his Les Paul, yeah. he would use other guitars to get another sound. So it was basically kind of a layered thing. And, and so on all of Quiet Riot 1, which is where most of the photographs of him with it are from, yeah. was from the Wally Hyder sessions. Uh, he played my Strat as a, 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 to track the rhythm tracks for his, his, his second and third tracks on some of them. And he did a couple leads on it as well on that album. I can't remember which ones. And then Killer Girls, of course, he did the the lead on it as well as using the Strat to record rhythm tracks there. Now it's a Strat with a uh, with a Jazzmaster headstock or it, neck. It, it is it is the world's ugliest Stratocaster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, my old man bought it for me when I was like 13 years old or so. He paid 125 dollars for it. Uh, the only time that I have, uh, I have ever pulled a neck because back in the days, so oh, you find out how old it is, you pull the neck. Right. And um, it, it always confused me because the headstock never said Stratocast, said Fender. Yeah. And, the, you know, all the fine print and the copyright and everything like that. And, and uh, it, it always confused me because it never said Stratocast. I thought somebody must have scratched it off or something, you know, yeah. took the decal off, uh, which, which was the case. Yeah. But... 
I, I didn't figure out for years later because I finally looked at the little tiny decal up at the top of the headstock, and instead of saying original contour body, it says offset contour body. <laughs> and I said, well, offset, that's, on, that's a jazz master. Yeah. And so, which has a different radius than Strat does and for any guitar players. But uh, so it's, we figured out that, oh, hey, it's a jazz master neck on a Strat body. And, and you know, it's, it's 40 years ago I popped the neck on it last. It's a 62 or a 63 neck. I can't remember exactly. But we're, we're going we're gonna to do that again since we're going to basically trying to redo this with Billy. Um, so the uh it, it always kind of like baffled me exactly what i had so we well, figured it's just early 60s strat and it, it's kind of unique because you know before anybody was doing any crazy switching on it instead of having the three-way switch or the five-way switch that it would have come with as a as a new guitar it had three toggle switches oh wow and so oh, yeah. it was each pickup on and off yeah and so you could do one or two or three or one and two and three or one and three yeah, or, wow, or wow. Whatever. Frankenstrat. Uh, and like, it was a like Frankenstrat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in addition, there was another switch. It was like way up on the lower horn. And that was to throw the bridge pickup out of phase with everything. Oh. And so, which it, that's actually the tone that he used on that on the Killer Girl solo. Wow. Um, it's this really funky, honky kind of uh, guitar tone. And it, uh, it's, it's a fun sound, you know? So you and, want to do that and you want to get a music school going too, well, right? No, here's, you know, I, I had this crazy idea cause I'm bouncing stuff off of Billy. It's just trying to put together a package. And, and I said, you know, let me see, I, I can maybe get, you know, Ron and Kelly and Andrew to, to, to maybe do the books and we can package the books with it. And that's a great idea. And uh, I can maybe get, uh, uh, you know, I said, you know what? I said, nobody does, they're, you know, you, you see like a Clapton Strat or something, and you have no idea how they got that, that design. You know, how exactly did you come up with this is Eric Clapton Strat? I said, you know, let's do this. Let's just document the hell out of it as we take it apart. Yeah. You show what all the pieces are, the date stamps, the routing, the wiring, everything, and we'll put it together in a package with it. And, you know, as, as I'm doing this, and, and you know, this, I, I'm doing this, and it's not necessarily to make me money. Yeah. Because I, I, I've done a couple show and tells with the guitar, and, and I have a lot of respect for the Rhodes family. And, you know, Randy was, uh, you know, aside from maybe my father, I was no, there's not a single person's death that's affected me more. Right. I mean, I, I stopped playing for 20 years. Wow. I, I put my guitar, I couldn't pick them up. I... I bought the Aussie albums like right after they came out. I couldn't listen to them. Yeah. I couldn't listen to them for years. Who they called you on it? Did you get a call or did you see it on the news? Uh, it was my wife at the time and called it up and she says, Randy's dead. And at the time I knew like three Randys and, and one guy was like a gaffer at the studios. And I figured he got electrocuted or something. And, yeah. You know, cause I could say, no, Randy, guitar, Randy. And I, no. And uh, man, it was just like one of the worst days. It was just terrible. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, so, you know, you know, I was saying earlier, Randy was really, really humble. Uh, and a lot of people look at Randy and say, man, he's a rock god. He's like, and, and, and I, and I've done it too, man. I, I've gone into Guitar Center and they say, hey, you want to win this Les Paul with Slash's autograph? And I said, well, you know, maybe Les Paul, but, you know, I don't need it autographed. Yeah, right. You know, when they look at me kind of funny. I says, man, I've worked with gods. I don't need to work with the minions, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, and, and, I, and I respect Slash, but still, it's because it's, yeah. uh, God knows everybody's better than me. I'm one of the guys, those guys just still plays blue scales. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the... Pentatonic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyways, I wanted to do something, I, and I called up, Kelly Rhodes, and, and you know, I still think of him as Doug, so if I switch off, yeah. you know, because when I met him, it was Doug Rhodes, and then it was Kelly Rhodes, and, and uh, you know, so I, I, I sent him a message on Facebook, actually, and, and, and said, hey, hey, Kelly, you know, I got this idea, I'd like to do something, you know, I, I've got this guitar, I've had like crazy estimates of what it's worth, I don't want to sell it, I want to try and do something with it, and I'd like to do something where I can, you know, do something in your brother's name to remember him by, uh, I know your mom set up the scholarship at UCLA and, and CSUN. Uh, I, you know, I, is, are there any other charities that you're involved with that I can do a donation in Randy's name? And he was really negative. He was, uh, he did everything he could to shoot me down. 
Um, and, and, you know, I, I still respect them because, you know, they're, they're, a lot of people have made a lot of money on their brother and they put it in their own pockets. And yeah. that's not what I want to do, you know? And, and I'm thinking, you know, what would be a good tribute for Randy? You know, and, and I started thinking for, for, for this last year, you know, I, I got, I got 30 some odd guitars, you know, and a couple of my pick, I pick them up every once in a while cause I get a screaming deal on them and the, they need repair and I'll fix them up and hang them on my wall cause they look pretty. And, yeah. and I had a friend of mine's mother come to me one day last year and said, do you think you have a, a guitar that my daughter could borrow and maybe give her a couple lessons? I said, yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. And I, I let her have the guitar and, and. This, this poor family, man, if it wasn't for bad luck, they'd have no luck. Yeah. I mean, they had a tree fall through their roof in their apartment building. Oh. I'm just crazy. And we went over there at Halloween and, and uh, uh, bring them some food and stuff. And, and daughter comes over to me and she says, you know, I'm going to give this back to you. And I says, why are you giving it back to me? Did you change your mind? You don't want to learn anymore? And she says, no. She says, mom just doesn't have time to get me out there. And, and you know, I don't want to have your guitar. And, and I said, you know what? I says, do you still want to learn? And, and she says, well, yeah. I says, are you still practicing the stuff I gave you? And she says, yeah. I says, you know what? The guitar is yours. Well, wow, that's I cool. Says, you, you keep this, man. This is yours. And if you ever decide you don't want to do, you pay it forward. Yeah. Because. Totally. You know, and uh, at, at Christmas time, we had a similar situation. We adopted a family and, and you know, 40 year old guy. And it's like, I, all I've ever wanted to do is learn how to play bass. And man, I've had good luck this last year. I, I was down here, um, visiting my mom. I'm, I'm here to visit my mom right now. She's late stage Alzheimer's and, wow. and I want to get down before she forgets who I am. But, uh, I had really good luck last year. I, I, I get this email and uh, like a year ago today and it says, congratulations. Cause you know, I enter everything. Yeah. yeah. Win a guitar. Congratulations. And it's like, shit, I want a guitar. You know, and, and I won a brand new J, J bass from Sam Ash. It was crazy. Wow. And, and I, you know, I, and I said, I got, I got to pay this forward. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had, I took a little Aria Pro 2 PJ that I had bought off of an auction that I had won and I'd fixed it up and I repaired some gashes in the body. And the, this family we adopted, the husband had on his, like, there's no way in hell that I'm ever going to get this. But all this time, I've really wanted to play bass. And the guy is disabled. And, and, and I said, you know what? So I'm, I'm going to get to watch a 40-year-old guy cry. Yeah. yeah. And I, I handed him the bass, and he teared up. And, you know, between, between that and, and, and giving the one girl the guitar, yeah, it feels good. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, but I, I, I don't do it for me. But get, it feels get, good. get people on Instagram. It, it feels man. good. And, you know, I thought about it. The more I thought about it, and the more I'm talking to Billy up at, at uh, uh, you know, Rock and Roll Relics, I'm thinking, you know, I could do something good with this. And so what, what I want to do is I want to take the first money that comes out of this, and I am going to be working for the next six months to get a foundation started up to basically try and take the profits from these things and donate or not donate, but basically buy guitars, lower end guitars, entry level guitars that we can find kids or, or even adults that for one reason or another cannot afford an instrument and really have the desire and the want to learn how to play and provide them with a guitar. Yeah, that's cool, man. And the other thing that I wanted, you know, I started thinking, you know, because, you know, we're talking with Billy and like I said, I got the world's ugliest Stratocaster, yeah. you know, and, and it's... But it's to me, it's beautiful, and to anybody that's a fan of Randy, it's it's uh, it, it's this amazing piece of history. But we're only going to do a hundred pieces of it, so I, you know, I'm thinking, you know, hey, money's going to run out really quick. Yeah. And so uh, Billy is planning. We're trying to get this done so we can have this introduced for for the Nam show in January down in Anaheim. Uh, and what I want to do, and and uh, we're hopefully going to get some additional. Uh, uh, publicity out of this in terms of, of approaching the other major guitar companies because that's who has most of the you know the signature model guitars the the Stevie Ray Vaughns and the Jimmy Pages and the Jeff Becks and the yeah. Clapton models and God knows who else has their own I mean there's like five thousand people that have their own model guitars now totally. and you know these guys are selling records. They're making money. If you're that good that you're selling records and you're making money and you're, you're probably getting a little bit from every time one of those guitar sells, I want to put out a challenge to those guys and, and to the, to the majors 
to, to Gibson and Defender and, and say, when I get this with this foundation up and running, start kicking some money over this way because, hey, we're going to be, you know, you, you, every time you sell a Stevie Ray Vaughan Stratocaster, we're going to probably be able to, every one or two guitars, we're probably going to be able to afford to buy a little Squire Strat or something. Yeah, yeah. And so what you give on one end, you get back on the other. Yeah. And, and I want to work with the, the music stores because we want to buy them from the stores. I don't want to buy them direct from the manufacturer because I want the stores to have a reason to participate too. And the only thing that we want to get the stores to do is shit they already do, which is usually give away a free lesson with your, with your guitar purchase. Totally, man. You know? And so we get these people off on a good start. Well, thanks and for doing the show, dude. That's a, that's a that's an amazing uh, idea, and and I can't wait to see the guitars. I go to Nam show every year, and with Billy, and it'll be interesting to see this guitar. and And you got pictures of it on Facebook and stuff. Uh, What's your Facebook? There, there are. I'm uh, I, I I'm actually Harold Bear on Facebook. Uh-huh. Uh huh. B e a r. Well, yeah, B e a r. I'm I'm up in Washington. Uh, yeah, I do have pictures of some of the instruments up there. All right. Um. But uh, this is something that I, you know, I've kind of uh, this has kind of come to me over the last few months, and you know, I, I, I sat up in bed at like four o'clock in the morning. I said, I got it. I know exactly what I have to do. That's cool, man. And uh, you know, I, I, I want to do this. I want to do something good. Uh, but it's it's because I remember Randy not just as the rock god, but it's as the the genuinely humble. Uh, person that he was that you know man if you asked him how do you play that or, or can I see your guitar if he knew it it would inspire you he'd hand you his Les Paul that's cool man you know he was that kind of guy that's cool well thanks for so. doing the show man hey you're very welcome man. great to meet great. you and uh, 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 interesting story of uh, being there ground zero of Randy Rhodes yeah we, we got to keep in touch I'll probably be down uh, I'm going to try and make it down for Nam with Billy so totally all right, thank you so much. There you guys go. Thanks for tuning in and check check them out on uh, Facebook and and look for that guitar out there at Nam Show and RockandRollRelics.com. All right, that was uh, an interesting rock and roll tale or two from our our boy there, Harold. Now let's get into part two of this uh, Monday double episode with Mister Knight. All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk. Introduce yourself, my man. Hi, my name's Knight Bob. I work for a lot of bands. Live bands. Live bands. Right oh, now, you're out on tour with Steely Dan, right? Yes, it's my summer job. Wow. I like it a lot. Yeah, right? Steely Dan? I mean, uh, how long you been um, mixing Steely Dan? Because I've seen him three times this last year. So. I, don't, I don't mix Steely Dan. What, what do you do? I am in tour management. Tour management? Yeah, with Steely Dan. Wow. Did you used to mix? I mix. Most of the bands I work for, I mix. That's my main... Uh, it's the main thing I do. This one is a little different. Now, what year did you start in rock and roll? Because I was talking to Billy, and, and he's like, he mixed Aerosmith when we saw him at the Monsters of Rock. That's, that's not true either. Um, I started mixing, um, I've been involved in live performance since 1966. Wow, that's when I was born. There you go. You know. And where are you from? I'm from the New York area. New York area. And how do you get into rock and roll? Is it like the Fillmore and Hendrix and all that shit? I went and I saw, I went to the Fillmore and I did see Hendrix play. And and, uh, just a fan of music, you know, I played in bands, right? And I was offered a job running a rehearsal studio in New York City. And my band, the the catch was I could rehearse my band there for free. Nice. Right, so it was good and a uh, good place to be. It was the crossroads of the music scene in New York City. So and w- I saw a lot of bands, met a lot of musicians, learned a lot of things. What year uh, do you start working at the studio? That's like uh, 72. 72. 72. So you're working in there. And what, and what kind of bands are rehearsing there at the time? Oh, like uh, everything from Miles Davis to the New York Dolls to bands like Stories, Looking Glass, Humble Pie, Peter Frampton, Fog Hat, Johnny Winter for weeks at a time. Wow. And uh, lots of good bands. 
Wow, that's incredible. So you're working there, and you're seeing these guys. Are you are you losing your mind or what? No, not really, because you had. It was New York, right? You know, it's like you get um, you get used. To, you you don't let the celebrity aspect take over. You know, they're just working musicians. You know, and you just want them to sound good and to be comfortable so they can do what they do. Right. So the you know the aspect of I mean I will admit that when the door opens and Miles Davis comes in, you take a deep breath. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I don't know very many people that have actually uh, watched Miles Davis rehearse. You know, or talk Pretty to him. Pretty interesting. He doesn't talk very much. Right. That's that's crazy, right? Yeah, it's good fun. It's good. So you're working there in '72, and is it one of those things where you just you start to kind of uh, like you know set up the soundboard and stuff? You know, well, it was a rehearsal studio. All that stuff was was set up. It was right. Like a walk in and mix thing. You know, I get just it. Get the band up and going. So they can do what they need to do, you know, and, and to be comfortable. And it was, you know, the place I worked at, which was called Baggies, right, uh, was had um, really good gear. And it was a good learning experience to be able to watch, you know, a lot of these musicians play from a couple of feet away and watch the process of how bands write songs, how bands put music together, how bands put a performance together, how they deal with each other. You know, so it was a, it was a very much like a rock and roll college. Wow. You know, learned a lot. Worked, you know, met with a lot of people. At what point are you like, ah, fuck playing in a band. I'll just start working, <laughs> working for the bands. Well, here's the deal, right? It's like when you work in a place like that, no matter how good you are, you begin to realize that there's a lot of people a lot better than you. Right, that the bar is way higher than you may have uh, originally uh, suspected. That you were the small, you were the big fish in the small pond. So over a period of time, um, you begin to realize, you begin to pick up extra work because they need an engineer, they need someone to make their amp sound right, and begin to realize that the it's very easy to be uh, successful in the service end of the music business. Because there's less people who know what they're doing. Yeah. Right. And you can bounce from band to band um, and do, you know, show different shows. I and mean, I've done shows with everybody with all kinds of everybody from Johnny Cash to, uh, you know, to Iggy and the Stooges. Wow. You know? And uh, you, you get a bigger worldview and you just, you can, you know, you can survive. Right. You know, rather than being a guitar player, you know, where it's a constant battle to survive. All bands are a constant battle to survive. Especially these days. Oh, yeah. It's, pretty, it's, a, it's a tough road right now for a band. I wouldn't be in a band right now. No. no. <laughs> right. It's just tough, you know. I mean, unless, I'd say unless you really have um, a way to have a good social media presence and to realize that all of a sudden your music has become like... Um, there's no value to recorded music right now. Yeah. So it really kind of diminishes what you do. It makes you into have to hustle, you know, to make money. I mean, you make more money from T-shirts than you ever will from recorded music now. Absolutely. And it's very tough. It's very tough, you know. And I bands that, that try and achieve something, I give them a lot of credit because I know how hard it is. You know, I mean, there's less and less places to play. Right? There's no record company ideal anymore, you know, and the internet is flooded with all kind of bad music. Yeah. So how do you stick out? Yeah. How yeah. do you how do you reach people? It's a lot it's a different kind of work. So when you work in there, uh you were a guitar player. Yeah, still uh, am. Still are? Mm -hmm. What were you playing? Les Pauls, the, Marshalls? I was, guitar, I was playing the Gibson Firebird. Firebird? Yep. Dope. Mm -hmm. Straight up Skinner, yeah. Johnny Winter stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I was watching Johnny Winter a lot, but I, I got that. I had I had a Firebird. That's when guitars were affordable. Yeah. You know, when uh, they hadn't reached this collector status thing. You know, everything's too expensive now. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's man. crazy. I mean, look at Walter Becker. He's got like Karina V's and Explorers, and I'm looking at that guy's collection. He's got like 900 guitars. He doesn't have that many. <laughs> I know, but it yeah. just seems like, you know. He's got, he has some nice guitars. You know, he's a good player. I've learned a lot working for him. Right. You know, and uh, I'm watching how, you know, his process, you know, it's all about the process of making music. You know, it's not about the gear. You know, it's about the person and what they're trying to uh, 
to express or whatever. So like I say, you know, bands nowadays, it's hard to get noticed and it's hard, you know, because bands need to play in front of an audience in order to get good, you know, and if you just rehearse in a rehearsal room or your garage for a year or something, it doesn't make you a good band. No. You know, because, you, you, you know, you really have to get that, you know, see how it goes with, with, at, with the average person. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you, what is the first band that... Uh, Decides to take you out on the road there <laughs> in, the, in the 70s. In the 70s? Okay, I'll put it this way. Uh, first time anyone ever paid for a plane ticket yep. me and put me up in a hotel was uh, Iggy and the Stooges. Wow. Iggy and the Stooges. What yep. year are we talking? 73. 73? Yep, 1973. And... You're working at the studio, and they said, "Hey, man, we want you to go on the road well, with it us." It was no, it was it was more like this. They came in to play a week of dates at Max's Kansas City, and they were traveling basically with a tour manager and a sound engineer, and they needed they were using rented backline, and they wanted someone to come with the backline, and I was that guy. So I came, I did these shows. They liked what I did and then called me back uh, a little time later to come up to Detroit to do two shows at the Michigan Palace. Wow. And and what kind of, uh, how radical was Iggy then? Because I, I've he seen... He's pretty radical, I must say. Uh, he, <laughs> was, uh, there was something to watch, you know, because like at those Max's shows, I was standing like three feet away from him on the side of the stage. Right. And uh, it was something to watch. He was a very, very interesting performer, you know, always giving 120%. And uh, it, was, it was a thrill to see that. That's insane. So you start working for Iggy. Yeah, and that was just a couple of shows. It wasn't many shows, culminating with a New Year's Eve show in uh, uh, Academy of Music, New Year's Eve, 1973. And then after that, does the like, uh, word get out that, hey... Uh, this guy knows what he's doing? Yes, that's true. Uh, like a couple of months later, I wound up going out on tour with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Wow. And now... Prog rock, baby. Prog rock, absolutely. Mm -hmm. At what point do you start to, to mix live? Because How do you learn to mix live? Because by doing it. By doing it. By doing it. It's the only way to learn. Because the 70s sound was pretty awful, right? No. No? No. I mean, when I went to shows, it was just... Well, if you were born in... Seven, what, what, what 66. 66. Do you, actually, do you actually remember what it sounded like? I do, because I remember it being fucking loud as fuck. And that's, well, that was part of what it was supposed to be. That's all I cared about. I mean, that guy... I see. Mm -hmm. But, the, but that's, a, that's a strange scene back then, because you're really, you're really thinking about... You've got a few outdoor festivals going mm -hmm. like over the years, like, of course, Woodstock and Altamont mm -hmm. and all that, mm -hmm. and those big things in the park. But all of a sudden, concert business is so big, it becomes uh, football and, and baseball stadiums. Right. Mm -hmm. And... And that is a strange place to mix live music, right? Yeah. Mm hmm Outdoors is better than indoors. And, and it is? Yeah, I think so. Why is that? Because you don't have a roof and uh, you don't have uh, the sound bouncing around quite so much as you would indoors, you know, in a, a facility made for sports. You know, intelligibility was not a high, uh, high demand back then. But uh, see, it's interesting, you know, those bands, you know, they needed to be loud. Yeah, they did. Like that. Nowadays, you know, a lot of the bands sound wimpy to me. Yeah. yeah. Is that because there's DB level uh, limits at all the no, venues? No, I think the music's wimpy. Oh, the music's yeah, wimpy. The music's wimpy. Yeah, well. Wimpy <laughs> music does not sound good really loud. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I. It just I, sounds wimpier. I saw ACDC three times this That's year. Not wimpy. Not at all. No. And they are so, loud. so fucking loud. They're I think loud. it's the loudest I've seen besides Boston on the Boston 3 tour. <laughs> Boston was the loudest show really? I've ever seen. Really? Which I can't believe. I saw um, a bit of ACDC at Coachella. Oh, yeah, I was there. And, uh, yeah, Steely really Dan great. played that it week. Was, yeah. It was really, really good. They, were, they sounded great. They did. They played through a lot of amps. Yeah. You know... So you're, you're out with the, uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and... Yeah, uh, it was a, a, a very good discipline, because it was like I was one of maybe four Americans on a predominantly British tour. Yeah. And they run a tight ship. Yeah. Right. And there's a whole, whole levels of uh, 
who you can talk to and who you know where you fit in the giant machine well, american rock bands kind of weren't like that right it's it's a strange thing to be out uh on a tour with a, like a big, big arena tour because you've got all these employees yeah. and, and there's uh, just, it's like a city. Yeah. And, and, and there's got to be people out there that you, you don't like on the tour, right? Is that, does it work like that? No. Yeah, I mean, on a level, like on a Rolling Stones level, I think you, you really get um, the cream of the crop. Oh, yeah, they totally. Are idiots. You yeah. know, I mean, like, I'm sure you know Pierre. Yeah, I love Pierre. I love Pierre. Of course, uh, mm -hmm. Opie, but now he's with yeah. ACDC. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Now, they're good people. They're at the top of their game. You know, they're, they have 30, 40 years of experience doing, doing shows. You know, they're total professional. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're you're out and you get thrown into doing some live sound and, and well no i didn't get i never got thrown into it i mean when i played in bands i kind of looked after the pa right you know, so i was aware of the technology you know my father was an electrical engineer right and he helped uh he helped uh me to understand the process of live audio and help me get the kind of power i needed to do it right you know so it's Kind of always been in, uh, in in the audio end of it, right? You know? So I was never really thrown into it. You know, it's like mixing is is an attitude. You know, because you have you're making all you're doing is making choices about how loud something should be, or does this sound right? You know, uh, if, is the balance balance is very important. You know, the balance between the vocal and the rest of the band, how loud the drums should be. When the guitars come in and out, can you hear the bass guitar? Does the bass guitar work with the kick drum? That's the process that's going through your head. So it's not really that enjoyable a process. You know, you, know, you don't really get to, you know, you're, you're constantly checking balance and how things sound. You're not really, in, you know, listening to the music as like an average listener would. Right, right. You know, you're so constantly... Constantly uh, reevaluating. Wow. And, and so after kind of like flying a plane yeah right it, wow. well i mean live sound is so fucking crazy because are you the guy that picks the actual rig that goes out on the tour too if you're lucky enough if you're lucky enough yeah i mean some tours you know very some tours carry you know carry a pa others will just carry control which is the 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 desks and monitors and stuff like that and then use stacks and racks speakers and power from local companies, right? Or you're using uh, whatever's in a certain venue. Like a lot of times, you wind up using the casino, the PA that's installed in a casino. You know, because right. casinos are a bit are a good third of, uh, of what touring bands go to now. Yeah, that's true, definitely. Um, now there's digital mixing now. Yeah. And and that's what everybody uses, right? Yeah. But back in the day, you had to just kind of create the mixes as you go. But now you just can program the mixes. No, not really. See, the, what the digital revolution, what it has done for you basically, has made your life more complicated, right? Because like when you're in an analog world, everything is in front of you, right? Not on separate pages. And you make certain choices, you know. I mean, there's certain rules you follow as far as gain structure and EQ and things like that. It's all about getting the music balanced, right? When you get into the digital thing, everything is not in front of you. You have one channel strip, and, uh, you know, yes, you're able to save things, but every day is a new adventure in live audio. You know, what worked in the room yesterday does not necessarily mean it's going to work for you today. So you're constantly having to flip back. I find the focus a little different. You right. Know, it's rather than being able to see everything at once and touch anything without moving a mouse or using a select button to pull something up. The but digital is here. You know, everybody uses it. Everybody uses it. Yeah. Do, you, do you think it's better or no? I think now, I mean, it's a tool. You know, it's a hammer. You know, it'll drive a nail. You know, that's the job of that. You know, that's the job. I mean, you can mix really good on, on digital. You know, you're still making the same choices using your ears to, cho to choose what something should sound like in the context of, of the music, you know? Right. So after Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, who do you mix next? Is it Aerosmith? New York Dolls. New York Dolls. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, did they, how many tours did they do? One, or did they do a bunch? They did a bunch. They, were, they did a lot of weekend work. 
You know, we'd go out and you'd play a Friday and Saturday and come home. Or, or go out, you know, go play England, you know, play some sh- couple of shows there and come home. They weren't really, touring really wasn't like it is now in 72. Only certain bands like the Stones could do an actual tour. Most of the time you were just going from show to show to show. Oh, kind of like off one off weekends. Weekends, yeah. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. I it's never very different now. I never really mean? thought about that because what happened was all like the places like the Phil Maurice they went away. Yeah, right. So you have you know people having you know shows at colleges or whatever. You know, I did college shows with the Dolls. I did club shows with the Dolls. I did big festivals with the Dolls. Wow. It was what, great fun. Oh, what, what were those great guys fun. like, man? They're great people to be with. It's just incredible. Well, I wouldn't know if they were incredible, but they were. They were. They they had something, you know. They they had something that was uh, special. I think. You yeah. Know? And uh, I think they were ahead of their time. You know, I think it took the culture a good twenty five, thirty years to catch up with what they were doing. Right. And they got a payoff. They reformed in, the, in you know, like 2005 and went back and did some shows and made some money that they, they never made any money in the 70s. Yeah. Hardly any of those 70s bands made any money, you know, because it just costs. The cost of moving musicians and gear around, around the country is very expensive. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's really amazing to me is the thought of the early tour buses compared to now. You know, like those buses were just Greyhound buses back then, right? Yeah. You were just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, sat in them. And mm-hmm. like you see on Almost Famous, <laughs> you're just sitting in seats. You're not in uh, bunks. You know, they had bunks. They, I, mean, I know that when I had a bus in 75, they had bunks. It had bunks? Right. They, you know, that, just those old Eagles? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's crazy, man. I mean, now... It's part of the adventure, you know? It was better than going to airports. Yeah, right? Yeah, it was. I believe that, too, because the bus is actually like this amazing submarine, and your team's on it, and you're just kind of cruising around America, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of like the, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, the fantasy yeah you know it's not it's 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 a grueling lifestyle oh it is grueling grueling and most bands work five to five six nights a week traveling 500 miles between shows you know riding in a bus you know with the same six people 12 people or whatever you know and it can, familiarity breeds contempt you yeah know, when you have people in a contained environment all the time and it becomes like groundhog day you know it's the same day over and over again yeah. And uh, some people come apart from that lifestyle. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And, and a lot of people are dying now, you know? Well, they're, they're dying because they're old. You well, know? yeah. Like, I mean, not because they're, they're riding around on a tour bus, you know? It's like either they haven't taken care of themselves or it's just the luck of the draw, you know? I mean, like most of the musicians that I worked with in the 70s uh, are now in their 60s. Yeah. You know, and, it's, uh, and it's, their time has come. The, the 70s is just, it had to be a, insane to be out on the road because it's just f- fear, like drugs. And, and <laughs> it's like, it, it really is sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? Yeah, well, you know, I really don't want to rain on your parade. It wasn't, it was not that glorious. <laughs> it, was, it was not that glorious. You mean for the techs or the, or the band for everybody guys? Everybody involved. Really? For everybody involved, yeah. I mean, like, like, uh, there was uh, a certain amount of things like that going on, but it wears off really fast, you know, because you're uh, there. It's you're objectified, you know. You re- you're they want to be with you because you represent something, not because you were you. Yeah. And after a while, that takes a toll, and you get tired of it. You know, it's sort of uh, it just becomes a bother. Yeah. You know, of uh, you know, and you're out for months and months at a time. You know, it's just like, and you're doing a lot of shows. You know, it's not that much time for that kind of stuff. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Day off, you know, you're in a day off in Omaha, Nebraska. Good luck. You know? <laughs> Good luck. Well, that's where the drugs come in. Well, not really, you know. It's sort of like recreational drug use. It's sort of like that's been going around, you know, like, since the, the 20s, you know. And yeah. It's like, but drugs cost money, you know. And yeah. It's like, unless you have money, you don't have any drugs, you know, so... People aren't offering up drugs. They don't have any money either. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what do we got after uh, New York Dolls? After Who- New York Dolls, I went to Aerosmith. Aerosmith. Yeah. Now, 
what year is this? 75. 75. Uh, first record? Is that no, second I, record? End of, the, end of the cycle for the third record. Gotcha. Toys in the Attic. Toys in the Attic, yep. the big fucking record. I guess. I yeah, you know. got Walk This Way. Yeah. You know? And, and what are you doing? They're out headlining? No, no. When I joined them in 75, they were still doing some open, opening slots. They opened up for uh, Black Sabbath. They opened up for the Edgar Winter Group a couple of times. But by the, t you know, the time that winter uh, tour was over, they weren't opening for anybody anymore. Right. They had, you know, the accelerated to that, you know, where well, like we'd open up for Black Sabbath at Madison Square Garden, and the day after, two days later, we'd be headlining the Forum in L.A., Wow. Yeah, so it started to re they started to really break in, in uh, mid-75. That band in the 70s is absolutely fire, right? I mean, you got the, mu you got the songs and you've got this complete, just insane attitude and vibe. Yeah, because they've been working hard. You know, I mean, uh, when, you, when you play 100 shows a year, you, you know, you get better at what you do. Yeah, you know, so they were a pretty well well tuned band by the by the time I got them. They played lots of shows, you know. They knew how to play together. They made three records at that point because when you make a record, it changes the way you play together. Yeah, just because you're hearing things in a different way than when you're playing live shows, you know. So they they were pretty tuned up. I think '76 was their best year. Really? Honestly, yeah. Who? Uh uh, who was opening for him? Any cool openers like Cheap Trick or ACDC or any Cheap of that? Trick didn't exist back then. No. Nope. Um, you know, we had um, Ted Nugent opening. Ted for, Nugent yeah, opening. Ted Nugent was first record on Epic. He did. He had to do sixty to eighty shows with us. Wow. Same management too. Same management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Nuge opening. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's a five seventy six. It's amazing to think about. Um, like, let, let's say Edgar Winter or Robin Trower, mm -hmm. Pat Travers, Johnny Winters. These bands actually headlined that Oakland A's Coliseum. Mm -hmm. 60,000 people. Mm -hmm. Like Edgar Winter or Robin Trower. Mm -hmm. That's like unheard of now, like a guitar player selling out some arena, you know? The culture is different. The culture is very different now. It was like back then, it was cheap. Yeah. You could go to a big show for like $12, right? And you would be, it was a social gathering too, you know, it was the place to be. You know, like that show you went to was probably the place to be at Oakland Coliseum totally. that day. Totally. Because you had a bunch of bands and a bunch of kids and like everybody was out to have a good time. They were there for all the same reason. You know, like-minded. You know, they had to, they liked a certain band. They liked the music, and you were surrounded by people who were who liked the same band and liked the same music. And it makes for a good time. Absolutely. Nowadays, you know, everybody's just like you know, they stare at bands playing on stage through their cell phone or their iPad. You know, and they're totally divorced from participating in any way. It's like a spectator sport. Yeah. You know, they're not involved anymore. Yeah, there's no push pull. I always say, like, yeah. playing music. Uh, that's why I love doing comedy now, because no. you can't text or, or use your phone in there. So mm -hmm. it's like old school rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm with the audience, they're with me, and it's, it's mm -hmm. a wave, and it's going up and down, and, and uh, it's an experience. But mm -hmm. yeah, concerts now just seem to be like, uh, got to get the good selfie for Instagram. That's the only reason I'm there. See, that's, that's what I mean. The culture's very different. It's much more of a me Con, uh, concept than an us concept. Yeah. You know, of uh, people gathering to enjoy music. Now it's people gathering to observe music. You know, the very little participation on some levels and with some bands, you know. I mean, other bands, uh, you can't help but participate. And a lot of times in the smaller venues, it's much easier to keep everybody's attention focused, you know, in 25, 3,500 seats, smaller clubs, 1,000 seat clubs. Something like that. Clubs in general. Clubs are a great place to see a band. I love it. Because you're right up front, you know, and you can you really, you know, see if the band has the power. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Aerosmith, how long you mix them for? Uh, in the 70s, I did half of 75, all of 76, all of 77. I left in the beginning of 78. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And and who it's do great. you... great. I had a great time. Who do you go with after that? 
After that, I, do, I decided on a slight change of direction. You know, I went out with a singer-songwriter named Garland Jeffries, and he had a big record called Ghost Rider. And we spent about four months on tour playing shows, like playing like multiple nights at the Roxy and other gigs like that. We opened for Van Halen in Holland. That was an interesting experience. Wow. Yeah, and, um, and just keep at it, you know, and just do one thing leads to another. You know, you, you get a reputation of being able to do the job, you know, properly. You get, you're constantly in demand. Yeah. So I've been working pretty much ever since I left the rehearsal room. Wow, man, rehearsal that's crazy. Studio. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Who's the biggest band? Aerosmith? I don't know. I never really thought of it in those terms, you know? I mean, like, like uh, they've all, I only, I really work with successful bands, you know? It doesn't, it, and it depends what do you, how do you judge success, you know? I mean, uh, I worked with this band, Hanoi Rocks, you know, and they were oh, wow. like huge in Japan and huge in, in Europe, but meant nothing in the States. Yeah. Right? And Hanoi then, Rocks. What year was that? Oh, that that's that's much later. That's like a reformed Hanoi Rocks in oh, like I got two, you. 2005. But I saw the original Hanoi Rocks, and then later, uh, after they broke up, I worked with the singer Michael Monroe in his solo years. Yep. Great performer. Yeah, he's great, he's man. Really, I saw really him a amazing, few times. Amazing performer. Aerosmith, when you're working with them, did you start to see that, that total downhill vibe of, of the drug eras? Like, you're working like 78 i mean they're pretty 78 i was gone yeah I, I, when that shit really kicked in i was gone that was part of you know part of the reason to go because things had you know the uh had started to get uh silly you know so uh having seen these kind of problems in bands before it was time to make an exit yeah you know? so i ex exited that situation and wound up coming back in 1983 83 yeah done with mirrors tour no that's that's 86 86? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. I what? know I know my time frames. Really? Yeah. 80, 83, what record is that? 83 is basically... Um, uh, Back in the Saddle Tour, no, it was called? No, no, that's 84. Uh, 83 was the last days of Crespo, Jimmy Crespo. Oh, uh, I saw that today. tour. Yeah. Oh, Cal State, uh, Sacramento um, State Fair. No, I, I heard about that. But oh, man. I, I wasn't there for that. Yeah, I saw that. What? I a, what that was cr I mean, I that couldn't. Was pretty messy, I heard. Whoo. I think it's on YouTube or something, right? I still yeah. cannot believe that show because it was just like barely anyone there. And Tyler was out of his mind. And, and, and I was, they had that, that song, uh, I think it was Lightning Strikes. Right, that's what, that's what the Tyler Dufay record. I can't remember what the name of it is. So crazy. I also saw Aerosmith back there again on, I think it was a permanent vacation. Someone threw a rock at Steven Tyler, <laughs> cracked his head open, oh, man. Mid-show, they had to stitch him up. Yeah. What a man. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that that's yeah. insane. That's the way. That's that's a kind of an odd way of participating in a show by throwing a rock at somebody. I'm, or throwing anything. I've seen bands blown up by M80 fireworks and uh, get hit by things. I mean, something coming out of the dark, right in a twenty thousand seat arena, even like a quarter, yeah, or something like that. That can really hurt you. Oh my God! Are you, you kidding know, me? You can really get hurt. You can't even see it, and all of a sudden it hits you in the face. Like those opening bands back in the day, oh, they get just getting shit too. winged at them. Mm -hmm. I remember this band, The Fools, open for Van Halen. Uh -huh. People were just throwing shit That's at them. A it, tough nut, man. They just come to see Van Halen. It's like opening for Kiss. You know? Yeah, yeah. You ever yeah, mix Kiss? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. What in the makeup era? No, no. I had them as an opening act for the New York Dolls in 1974. Wow. Right? First record. First, first record. Their real, you know, part of their first real start of touring, and um, they were what they were. You know, I give them a lot of credit for the tenacity, and coming up with a, a thing that was, you know, that worked for them. Yeah. You know, I actually didn't wind up mixing them till like '88 in a post makeup Bruce Kulick. Uh, oh yeah, like revenge guitar, or something. Uh, pre revenge, crazy nights. It was kind of fun. It was fun. I had a good time. It was a European tour with uh, David Lee Roth solo. Ooh. Iron Maiden was the show closer. Whoa. Um, Guns N' Roses was way down on the bill. It's 1988. Oh, yeah. GNR's know, so record just comes out. I think out. it was like Guns N' Roses went on before Megadeth. Wow. Right? Crazy, right? You know, and uh, 
They were fun to watch. You ever mix uh, GNR? No, that's one of my on the on the to do lists. You know. Yeah. The short list of some. You know, I, everybody I know is mixed Guns and Roses, but me. Wow. You know, so it's like I feel left out. Now let's talk a little bit about the opening band and, and the rules. It's uh, do they get the half sound only? No. 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 Well, what's that rumor that's from? All fucking bullshit from the from the seventies. You know, I mean, it's like. It, it was uh, the English bands did some, did things like that sometimes, you know. But most, if you're a professional, working in a professional situation, you know, it's like you know you can't go in there trying to blow away the opening act. Right. I mean the the, the headline act. You don't try it. You know, you just be you just go and you play. You know, it's like I always let my any opening band do what they needed to do within reason, you know? I had bands like Slade open for Aerosmith. How are you going to tell Slade? Not, and Slade doesn't work unless it's smashing loud. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had Thin Lizzy open for Aerosmith, you know? Thin and, Lizzy. Yeah, and you, you, know, you respect these people. You know, you show people respect, you know, even if they're in that, that opener position. You know, you want to give these musicians the respect they deserve, you know? Because it takes a lot of fucking work to get where those bands are. Yeah, you know, I mean, totally. It's not, you know, you can't manufacture this shit. At least back then you couldn't. I mean, now everything seems to be kind of manufactured. Yeah, that's but a, the culture is different. You know, it's so true. Stuff, you know, they want to see you all singing and dancing now. Who do you think? Because uh, I've seen everyone pretty much, except for Zeppelin and uh, Skinner. Uh huh. Who do you think was like probably the best live band you saw? What do you mean by live band? How, entertaining? No, musically? I'm talking about just straight up like, wow, this like, band like crushes. Like blowing music you know, and as an experience? Yeah, just uh, the whole package. The whole package? Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd? Wow, Pink what Floyd. year? 75. 75? What is that, Animals? No, that's, uh, that would be Wish You Were Here. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And were you mixing them? No, no, no. I had friends who were working for them. And I went to see them as a fan, you know, and it was a quite, you know, it holds up for me as probably one of the top 10 shows of all time. It, it, it really, Pink those Floyd, guys. Out on Long Island. Long Island. Those guys are insane, right? Um, you know, they were different than most bands. It was the focus was totally on the music. There was no personality thing, you know. There was very little talking to the audience. There was no, like, let's raise our hands up, you know, let's all clap or any of yeah. that kind of stuff. It was a very solid musical experience, you know, cinematic in a way. Now, you're, you're tour managing for, um, for Steely Dan. Is that a new transition or did you just... No, I've been doing tour management since the 80s. Now, what does tour management involve, like... Is, do you, does the tour manager pick up the cash anymore, like the old Peter Grant? Like, where the fuck's the money, or is it all? Depends on what level you're working on. Right. You know, usually, um, the, sometimes the tour manager will settle, settle the show. On some bands, you have uh, a tour accountant who does all that, because the bigger your shows are, the more complex the settlements are. Like, when you're doing a certain band, you get, you get say, $5,000 for playing a show, and, and you get your $5,000. You know, when you get into bigger deals... You know, there's percentages on the back end, and you can be making a whole lot more money. Door know, deals. You know, all kind of, you know, different deals, you know. And then when it gets really messy like that, it's usually better to have a tour an accountant do it. Yeah, that's... Uh, now, back in the day, there was all the shady promoters. You just go to get the money, they'd be gone, right? No, not necessarily, because you get the money before the band goes on stage. Oh, there you go. You don't band doesn't play until you're paid. Wow. That's how you deal with shady promoters. <laughs> Wow, that's a good... No money, no play. No money, no, no play. play. Where's the money in my hand right now? Yeah. <laughs> you sound like Ace Freely there. I want to touch it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hold the money. Yeah. <laughs> no money, no play. No money, no play. You know, it's, it's the way it is. Wow. You, know, you don't want to, you know, be chasing some dickhead around, you know, at the end of the night trying to get paid. You know, it's bad. I've had guys, I've made people pay and they cried sometimes, you know, because it was like they were taking a beating. But it's too bad. It's like, just give me the money. You know, you're going to have to tell 5,000 people the band's not going to play because you didn't give me the money. Right. Wow. And they're going to be very unhappy. Wow. And those unhappy people are going to take it out on you. And the venue. And the venue. Yep. <laughs> yep. 
you know, so who wants to be responsible for that? Give me my money. What does the tour manager do now? Because everything's booked, right? The hotels are all booked. The no, gigs not, are... You know, there's, there's a lot of day-to-day -day details that you have to take care of. You know, I mean, the travel agent, they just book hotel rooms. So, like, if you get to the hotel and the rooms aren't ready or the rooms aren't right, then you have to kick into gear, you know? You're, you're basically running, you know, running a small organization of anywhere from, like, say, 13 to 100 people, you know? So you have have to keep your eye on things here when you're the tour manager you know it's a pretty pretty uh busy position you yeah know, you're always busy yeah i mean it seems like it's better just to do sound right yeah if you can get a job <laughs> where you just do sound you know as as the industry begin to shrink oh uh, multi-jobs you know, one guy two jobs thing you know you'd be like the tour manager and the sound engineer which is not too bad then the the mixing part becomes the best part of your day yeah. Because you can't take a phone call. You know, <laughs> you can't, no one can come and complain the bread's too small. You know, so you have, you know, so that 45 to an hour and a half that you have, you're in your element and doing what you do, having a good time. And then you come out of that element and you're back to like getting the band on the bus, sending them to wherever they're going next, make sure they have their after show food or whatever else, you know, depending on what level. Some bands, it's a pizza. Other bands, they can get a little more extravagant than that. Yeah. Yeah. Now you you're out with Steely Dan. You guys just did the Hollywood Bowl, one of the best fun. venues ever. How do you like that, that venue? Was good fun. Second, you know, second time they played there. Yeah, uh, I saw him there with uh, Elvis Costello yeah, last year. Yeah, I was there for that. Mm -hmm. Great show. It was a very nice show. Elvis is a cool guy, and his crew is exceptionally cool. What a what a man! I mean, Steely Dan is just hit city. I guess you know. I mean, um, the, the people who the people come. People have a good time. People come back. Boom. I guess that's you could say that's a pretty successful thing. You know that <laughs> they, that people like these. You know, you can tell you. You know, they like these songs and they keep coming back. So that's a wonderful thing. And it's outside of whatever is going on culturally. You know, it has no uh, no reference to Kanye or no reference to you know to, you know some of the other bands that are po kind of popular now. Yeah. You ever go out with any hip hop acts? No. 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 It's not my thing. Yeah, yeah. No. Straight rock. Who have you not worked for and you want to besides Guns N' Roses? Cheap Trick. I always like to mix Cheap Trick. It's a, you know, it's like I've never had the opportunity. I I got hired twice and then there there were uh events that happened that the tour never happened. One was the failure of uh, you know, the record company collapsing. And there went my English tour with Cheap Trick, you know, and uh, another time somebody, you know, it was it's a typical time, the financing wasn't there for the tour. Right. You know, so that slipped through my hands. Now they have a, uh, an excellent engineer and an excellent crew, and uh, I have to keep telling Bill Cozy, Cheap Trick's engineer, to it's like, just one day, man, just want to mix one show. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's like a hit by a car or something, you know. Just, yeah. I just want to mix one show. I've mixed Robin Zander solo. Right. right. So that's like one quarter of the band off the uh, bucket list. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, you know, like I said earlier, man, I wouldn't mind mixing Guns N' Roses. It's just because all my friends have, you know, and I haven't. You know, and uh, believe it or not, Blondie. Blondie. New, New York band, nice people. Clem, the drummer, good, great friend. You know, uh, we played in rival high school bands. In the in the '60s, so you know, it's, and like you know, they were part of that whole '70s breakout of music in New York. Yeah, you know, so that was kind of so you know, great that whole yeah, scene, right? Fun, you know, and they're nice people. So you got like uh, other than that, there's not too many. You know, I'd love to say I'd love to mix the Rolling Stones, you know, but you know, sometimes they go like, you know what? That's a lot of trouble. Yeah, you know, and I know their engineer. He's a great engineer, and uh, you know, it's like, you know. I just like to, uh, you know, I'm kind of in the, like the coasting mode now. I just like to pick little projects that um, are artistically fulfilling right. for me. Yeah, something you know? fun, not punching something in. Something fun. I work with some young bands, too, because that's how you keep in touch, you know, by listening to what they, they have to say or what they, they feel is important. You know, and uh, I was, it was one point where I was working for a band, and the uh, uh, I went to I took him to see a, a show in the 
Cena goes, is that your son? I go, no, and that's the guy I work for. And he was 16 years old. Oh, man. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Wow. You, you, what about Metallica? They've had the same guy for like 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a, like, can you imagine you go mix a metal band and then 30 years goes by? Here. Well, I feel mixing a band like Metallica is very successful. It's very easy to, you know. Just like, uh, like my, my, how time flies. Yeah, you know, right? How, uh, it's like, look at this. All these years just screaming by. It's crazy. Know? But uh, Big Mick, he's an excellent engineer, too. I go to Metallica just to check the show out. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's so I, good, I've right? I've seen him a bunch of times. Uh, any bands you haven't seen that you want to see? Mm, struts. Struts. Oh, yeah. man, they just opened struts. for... Um, they were out with... Uh, shit, who were they out with... Uh, they were oh, Motley Crue oh, on that boy. farewell tour. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of your favorites, huh? <laughs> Listen, you know, it's like, when you work in this other side, you look at things a lot differently than the fans do. You know, I, uh, it's like they play their music, the people come, the people have a good time. It's a successful day. I don't go home and put on Motley Crue. Right. I don't. You know, in fact, to be honest about it, I put very little, I listen to very little music these days. Yeah. You know, uh, because I'm involved with music almost all the time. When I go home, it's sort of like the sound, you know, just quiet is a beautiful thing. Isn't it? Yeah, it is, you yeah. know. And also when you step off that pirate ship of, of people, you're home. Let me tell you, the pirate ship is another fable, you know. It's like, it may have that kind of, kind of crap. Uh, usually happens um, with younger bands who are trying to live the life that they read about online or something like that. You know, um, majority of bands that are successful are successful because they don't do that kind of stuff. Right. You know, right. They, they're just like, I'm telling you, it gets old really fast. Well, I'm just talking about That's being in close quarters with people for, you know, months at a yeah, time. Like I said, it gets old, you know, yeah. you want time to yourself. That's why the single room is very important. Oh, God, yeah. A single room on a day off. That's a total bargaining point. Do they try to get two techs to stay together now? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then lower on the lower tours. In, in newer bands, you know, you're lucky if it's just two in a room. Wow. You know, um, because it comes down to the costs, you know. If you're a new band, your record's on the radio and everything like that, and, you know, you could be making a $1,000 a night, you know, and which gets burned up pretty fast, you know. I mean, like, like uh, just if you're in a van, fuel costs alone, hotel rooms alone. I was on a tour where I had a room, and then we had a smoking room and a non-smoking room, and there were, like, four to five people in each room. Whoa! This is pretty recent too, you know. I mean, a hotel room's like 150, 200 bucks, you know, times two, 300 bucks times, you know, uh, the driver's seven room, days, seven days a week. I'm just talking about band members. Seven right. days a week, you're talking 2,100 dollars, you know. If, uh, and there are bands who open for Van Halen and make 500 bucks Whoa. if they get paid at all. Really? Some some bigger tours you don't get paid. Is that right? Yeah. It's just you pay to get on it. Is Sometimes that true? Sometimes you do. Yeah, it depends on your age. If you got a good agent, you won't have to pay. But you just do it for free? And well, you do it because you want the exposure. I get you know? that, but I mean... The sometimes the exposure is not that good a thing because the people don't give a shit. They don't, right? They're, They're like, there to see Van Halen and you're just an annoyance. You're wow. just delaying their party. So. That's right now. Bands are out on the road not making any money. Oh, yeah. I'd say 70% of the bands who are out touring now are not making any money. That is incredible, right? Just digging up a debt. You know, it costs money cost money to tour yeah it does you, know. you think it'll go away no 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 i think people the the desire for music will always be there i know but once the big bands are gone let's say springsteen and and metallica and Van i don't know I, I mean i see I, I see the big shows are few and far between these days mainly because they're too expensive yeah you know that's that that's you know Everything's too expensive. I'm sure your rent is too expensive. It is. is too expensive. You know, everything's expensive. You know, so I think that's part of the killing it, killing off of the audience. Well, that's so insane. You know, just yeah. just to think about that. You know, soon we'll all be just watching bands in clubs. 
because no one, you know, music does not fill the role it did in the 70s and 80s anymore. Right. You know, people are uh, just obsessed with the internet, you know, and you can see the show from, you can see the big rock show minutes after it happened for yeah free. right on youtube right uh, yeah exactly and no dude throwing an m80 next year or well, spilling that's, a beer that's, that's part of the experience isn't it having yeah. the m80 oh i love that i'm just yeah. saying you know as you Pretty get older to get that shit nowadays you don't see that very much no you, you don't because uh people don't like you know people want to be safe yeah you know? and we live in troubled times we do we definitely do uh who, who's after steely Dan? huh who are, you, who are you gonna work for after Steely Dan? Go out and do some shows with Ace Frehley. Really, yep. Ace? I love Ace, and Ace the bass player is killer. Which one? Uh, what's his name? He, uh, he played in the Cult. Oh, uh, Chris Wise. Yeah, yeah, Chris Wise. Chris Wise is, is quite a bass player here. Oh man, he had a band called Owl. They were still has it. Oh, they're great. Still has it. He put, you know, I mean, like made a couple of records. He's a, he's a wonderful musician. Really good. I love uh, I love Ace. Uh, Ace Ace clean now. It's great. Ace has been sober for over eight years. It's so it's great, great, man. It's great to you know, great to work with him. He's a very nice man. I you love know, it. And he plays great, you know. And the people come, and they have a good time, and therefore I have a good time, and we all have a good time, you know. And it's like you can make you know make some money and you know rock out to uh, Cold Gin or something. Fuck yeah! yeah. Is Ace playing in L.A.? No. Damn. Not on the ones I'm doing. It's, oh, all, okay. it's all kind of like Texas and uh, I guess the Northeast. Man, that is so cool. Well, thanks for uh, talking to me, man. No problem. Really cool to... Uh, fun, Dean. I've never had a sound guy on yeah, before. Man. and You'll never will again. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, I don't know. I don't know what your audience is. You know, I don't know where, what you, you know... Uh, are they like a comedy based audience? You no, know, my, my, some my, my rotten my, stories about bands being mean or ba bad things happening to bands. We just talked about mundane stuff. You know? Well, I mean, I, I always want to know good stories, like, you know, drug stories. Yeah, or, I won't tell those stories. Yeah, exactly. That's people, why you work. Those people are still alive. Yeah. 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 And, and there's a certain amount of what goes on stays on. Totally. You know, it's a, I've been know, there. It's like. Um, I like, I like you want to be in business. If you can get the reputation of, of somebody who, who, you know, talks out of class, you know, they're going to have you signing non-disclosure forms, you know, and gag orders. And a lot of bands do that. They don't want people to know what goes on. Oh, they got that shit going oh, on yeah. now? Oh, yeah. They don't want you writing a book wow. afterwards. The old days, they didn't have that. So people just wrote oh, books. You'd be, you'd be surprised. Really? In the old surprised. days? Yeah, even in the old days, you know. They had non-disclosures, huh? Yeah, they had non-disclosure. And if you wanted to work, you didn't tell, tell tales, you know. So uh, some of those other people uh, who wrote books about, you know, the sordid 70s or whatever, they were making shit up, you know, yeah. or, uh, you know, Face, depending on who they're talking about, I mean, you can face some pretty severe legal uh, repercussions yeah. from saying shit about people nowadays, yeah. you know, or insinuating that they were, you know, doing drugs or having, you know, weird sex or, you know, destroying things or something like that, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was seen a lot of shit. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah, you know. Me so. too. I seen it. So you know, we say to the kids out there, "Don't do drugs." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Save your money. <laughs> <laughs> don't well, be in a band. Don't be in a band. There's too many shitty bands. Don't do yeah. drugs. Don't yeah. be in a band and uh, learn the computer. Well, uh, to be uh, to be a little more serious about it, it's like make real music. Make music that's important to you. Yeah. Right? And hopefully you'll find like-minded people who it's to be important to them as well. You know, I mean, if you're trying to chase a trend, you just get your way you'd be better off working in the post office. You make more money. Yeah, yeah, not only that, but you're already behind. The trend already totally blew behind. by by the you time know, you like, got the jacket. But you see it all the time. Yeah, you I do. Know, it's like Yeah. You, know, you didn't see it. Well, thanks, man. Where are you off to? Not a problem. I am going to Dallas, Texas. Da How much longer was Steely Dan? Uh, through the end of October. Wow, long yeah. one, huh? Yeah, there are breaks in between. I'm gonna, during one of the breaks, I'm going to go out and do some Fraley stuff. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you ever mix the dead? No. <laughs> Just asking. Yeah. 
No, no. That'd that be was, a long night, right? I guess. A friend of mine who worked at that same studio went on to work for the Grateful Dead for like 25 years. Wow. And he looks back at it as, a, as good times, you know? I love the dead. Yeah. I used to go see him, you know, until Pigpen passed away. Yeah. And they turned into a different band. And I went off doing my own thing, you know. It's pretty hard to to think about, the, you know, when you're touring with the New York Dolls, so, like, the dead kind of seems superfluous. Oh, completely, way, yeah. You know, that there's, there's, like, a party going on. And, and um, so... Did you ever do The Clash? No. Fuck. I saw The Clash really early on when I was in London. Yeah. But no. I saw The Clash. Yeah. They were incredible. Saw the Sex Pistols, saw the Clash, saw all these bands, you know, and it's like, I liked it. I thought it was good. I bought their records. I used to play Clash records on the 77 Aerosmith tour. Really? Yep. In, in the audience? Yeah, they, oh, you know. Oh, who picks that music? Uh, I in, do. In the house music, you I do? do? Sometimes the bands do, you know what I mean? There was a... a but pretty much in, in Aerosmith, they let me play whatever I want, as right. long as it wasn't Led Zeppelin. Oh, but, really? Yeah, because, you know... It's, competition? It's not really, it's not really competition, but it was, like, super popular, and you don't want to really... You don't want to change the focus of the audience of why they're there. Right, right. So we were using, like, this, you know, kind of subconscious thing where we're playing bands like Television and The Clash and The Sex Pistols and stuff like that, and kind of like a roving well, music education to the kids in the, in the Midwest. Wow, you know? that's cool. That's really cool. I have people come up to me like, you know, a million years later going like, I went to an Aerosmith show and you played The Clash. And I was like, shh, don't tell anybody. Man, that, that, there's nothing like Aerosmith in 76, 77, man. Uh, it was good. I, it was good. You know, it was, uh, I, enjoy, I, I gotta say, I enjoyed all my time with them. You know, I think that they did some amazing shows and um, were totally focused and... Uh, you know, all my memories at that time were good. I yeah. learned a lot. It was like a rock and roll post grad thing. You know, I mean, we had Leonard, we were playing fifty thousand people outdoors. Leonard Skinner as an opening act. Wow. Right? You know, and like hanging with Leonard Skinner was was cool. Dolls used to like to hang with Leonard Skinner too. Really? Yeah, it was a drinking thing. New York uh, Dolls. The New York Dolls would hang with Leonard Skinner. It was like you don't think that you think it'd be two cultures clashing, but no, they, I think. It was, you know, people, bands respected each other. It's totally. Like I said, it's a lot of work. You know, and you get to a certain point, you, you show respect for these people for getting that far. Because you, if you're in a band, you know how, how it is. Did you mix Cal Jam? I was at the first Cal Jam working with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, man, that is so crazy to think about this, too. Epic, you know, it's like also like the Us Festival, you know? I was there. You were there? Who'd yeah. you mix there? I wasn't mixing anybody. I was there as a visitor. Yeah, I went. I was just hanging. I was on some other tour, and I had friends who were uh, working for the other bands, so I went to check it out. Yeah, I, I did, to, too. To see the bit, you know. It was like the heat today. <laughs> it was hot. All right, well, thanks, man. Great talking. Yeah, nice to meet you, man. I th Say thank hi to Billy. I we should mention Billy Bro. Yeah, this Billy. The whole thing was brought together by Billy Rowe. How do you know Billy? I met him. I'd seen uh, a friend of mine played bass in Jet Boy. Oh, yeah. Back which one? day, Sammy Young. Oh, yeah, Sammy. Yeah, yeah. Manuel, Great right? guy. And then I m actually met Billy at an Ace Fraley show in San Francisco. Oh, wow. And... Uh, and then we became friends. I did a show where, uh, where Jet Boy opened up for the Wild Hearts in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. So, you know, and um, now he's got a great guitar company. And yeah, it's great. Uh, Rock yeah. and Roll Relics. Rock and Roll Relics, the only authorized Thunders guitar currently available. It's funny because you really worked with all the kind of super cool culty bands, right? Like New York Dolls and and uh, uh, Hanoi Rocks uh -huh. and uh, and the Wild Hearts. I yeah, mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, who else would you say that was like in, culty? Yeah, kind of. You know, oh, this. I don't know. You know, I mean, you could say the Stooges were culty, of course, you know, in a way. You know, but you pick sometimes. It's all by accident. Yeah. You know, somebody needs some help or somebody wants, you know, wants you to do something. And sometimes these bands don't seem to mean much at the time. Or they mean something to you, but the audience is not getting it or something. And it takes, like, the culture 20, 30 years to catch up, you know. And uh, I, was, I consider myself very, very lucky to have worked with some of these bands. That's so cool. All right. Well, thank you, man. All right, Dean. Take See you, brother. Man.